Hey, 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 sorry, I was trying to touch the driving wheel. <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, that's all right. I just went instinctual. It's OK. I got my coffee. I'm ready to go. We are in pajamas con. <laughs> yeah, it's very organized, very, very precise, organized. military Super operation. It's very, um, very down to the minute. <laughs> yes. So, um, yeah, have you got what, what have you got during the break? I have my coffee because I'm not <laughs> I'm trying to stay awake, stay alive, staying alive. Mm, yeah. yeah, well, I have my coffee as well. And that's just because I love the stuff. I mean, it's supposed to be drinking something more cozy. Why is it coffee? Coffee to me is cozy. That's the thing. Oh, it's like good. this is what I drink to relax. And it, caffeine does nothing to me, which is wonderful because I can drink it with impunity. Yeah, if I'm a participant, I I will be drinking uh, more wine, but I don't want to show you my drunk self too much. So <laughs> thank you. I'm trying thank you. to resist. Yeah. <laughs> Please yeah. cope responsibly. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like you know, uh, some of you may see me uh, in a pub or something before BC time, you know, before COVID. <laughs> and, you know. That is a thing now, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, well, but we'll, we'll, we'll get anyways, there again. I still so, have to do one of these ice cream sprints I have been told about. Have you been told about the, have you heard about these ice cream sprints? Well, or are you the one who told I'm me I'm the this? founder of the ice cream sprint. Oh, that's right. Thing. That's right. Couldn't remember if you or Laise that started that. One of the two. Yeah, like, uh, basically, I just I just have this kind of radar of finding good ice cream. So it just become a habit that I would run to get ice cream after lunch uh, in conferences so and then i would just ask everybody to join so i just call it ice cream sprint so there are people who are joining ask me like oh is it like what is an ice cream sprint are we working on some project i was like no we just sprint to get ice cream <laughs> yeah, yeah. literally just sprinting to justify the ice cream because then you can eat the ice cream it's like well i got exercise to get here so it counts mm -hmm. 
But so. yeah, before we drag on too long, I think uh, we have our next talk. So um, it it's a talk uh, from uh, our beautiful uh, speaker from uh, Juras from uh, Microsoft, and then um, so he did a wonderful demo this morning um, to show how to deploy an app uh, on uh, Azure uh, with Linux. So. Um, so it's uh, so basically what happened is that like he want me to uh, present this talk again. <laughs> so <laughs> so we we gotta we gotta show this talk again uh, for those of you who missed it, it this morning. Uh, you get the chance to watch it again, like well not again, but like watch it now live yeah, for the first and, time. And <laughs> um, if you have any questions, uh, you can go to the channel. They have actually a, a dedicated channel for Microsoft. Uh, for the team there so if you have any questions uh, you can ask questions there also they have uh, some freebies giveaway there with the qr oh. code as well make sure you don't miss that um so i think uh, we are kind of ready to play the, the demo and then um, maybe we can chat more about ice cream afterwards <laughs> <laughs> quite probably that's that seems to be our favorite yeah. okay i'll let you drive jason i'm not trying to okay. crash the car <laughs> <laughs> thanks for joining us today and welcome to our session, Deploy a Python Web App to Azure App Service on Linux. My name is Juarez Barbosa Jr., and I'm the Azure Developer Engagement Lead in Microsoft Island. In this session, we will deploy a Python Web App to App Service on Linux, Azure's highly scalable self-patching web hosting service. You use the local command line interface on a Mac, Linux, or Windows computer to deploy a simple app with either Flask or Django framework. So without further ado, let's start. Thanks, everyone. First of all, you have to set up an initial environment. So you need an Azure account with an active subscription. In case you don't have an account, you can create one for free here. Second thing, you need Python 3.6 or higher. And then you have to install the Azure CLI. Then you have to open a terminal window and check if your Python version is 3.6 or higher. Next, you have to check if your Azure CLI version is 2.0.80 or higher. And then at last, sign into Azure through the CLI. As you saw, this command opens a browser to gather your credentials. When the command finishes, it shows JSON output containing information about your subscriptions. Once signed in, you can run Azure commands with this Azure CLI to work with the resources in your subscription. Now we have to clone the sample web app. I created a sample folder Python docs hello world. So now let's clone it. The sample app contains framework specific code that Azure App Service recognizes when starting the app. Now it is time to run the sample locally first. And then I can create a virtual environment and install the required uh, dependencies.
I'm going to seize the opportunity here to upgrade my pip version. And now we can run the development server. Just to mention, by default, the server assumes that the app's entry module is in uh, app.py, as used in the sample. If you use a different module name, uh, see the flask underscore app environment uh, variable to that name. So now we can open a web browser and navigate to HTTP um, localhost um, and the port is 5000. Yes, perfect. And you can see the hello world message. So the application is up and running as expected. So we can come back to our terminal window and press Ctrl C to uh, exit the development server. Cool. Okay, so now we can deploy the sample app to Azure. It takes a short while, so let's wait a little bit more. We are nearly there. As we saw, the command may take a few minutes to complete. Uh, while you're running, uh, it provides messages about creating the resource group, uh, the app service plan and hosting app, uh, configure logging, uh, performing uh, zip deployment, and then it uh, gives uh, the message you can launch the app at uh, the address, which is the app's URL on Azure. So let's give it a try now. We can copy this address here. And yes, the application is deployed to Azure, so you can see how easy it is. As a last step, we can visit uh, the Azure portal now. Um, check to see the existing uh, resource groups. Yes, we can see our application here. And the application is here as well on App Service. Great. That's it. I hope you liked our session about deploying a Python web app to Azure App Service on Linux for beginners. If you're interested in knowing more about Python and Azure, the Python extension for Visual Studio Code, and our Azure Heroes digital badges, we prepared some technical resources that will support you. Please remember to visit the Zaka MS link or scan this QR code. Besides, if you want to reproduce the steps we presented today, 
please check a blog post on our channel on the Pyjamas event channel on Discord. Thanks everyone again and have a good day. Hello. Hey. I I will put the ticker in so people can can yeah. join the whatever they want. Exactly, <laughs> and this is also over in the comments. Uh, over, I can I see this is trouble. It's over there. It's over there. Oh. It's that way. Oh yeah, my 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 webcam is mirrored. Okay. Yeah, okay there you go. Yeah, mine's not. Uh -huh. and that's been confusing me this whole time. I keep trying to adjust my bow tie, and it keeps going the wrong way. And yeah, so <laughs> click over there. Uh, yeah, join the Discord. Um, uh, we have conversation ongoing there. Uh, but of course, we still have an opportunity to win a Python book from Packet. So enter that giveaway. And um, uh, also, we have Lightning Talks coming up uh, later on. So please sign up if you want to give one of those. Lightning, I don't think people realize quite what Lightning Talks are. And like the idea of just giving a talk on the fly might be scary to some people. Yeah, so lightning talk, basically, just like five minutes, you can do whatever you want. The most amazing lightning talk that I've ever experienced actually was in uh, PyCon Namibia ages ago, BC. <laughs> um, so, uh, uh, you know, the first day, because like you said, nobody knows what is a lightning talk. And um, so uh, what happened is that uh, we have a very uh, experienced organizer there, Daniel Pachetta, and like he, he, well, he kind of introduced, like he introduced this conference to us. That's why there's a few of us from the Europe and going to join PyCon Namibia. Um, so basically we, we are a frequent conference goer and then uh, Danielle was was like, uh, come, like you know, show 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 us what is lightning talk, because all of you know what is lightning talk. So we we all give a lightning talk, and the next day at the conference, they just queue up to give a lightning talk. Like everybody just queue up, no slides, nothing. They just grab the mic. So a guy was like, oh, I actually I don't know what is Python, but someone told me, oh, it's cool, come, it's free, and then he just go to the conference, um, and and then like he was giving a lightning talk and then talk about why he was there. It's like amazing, amazing thing. So um, yeah, yeah you don't have to prepare much if you have something to to talk about for five yeah. minutes or you know. Uh, even not five minutes, you know, you don't have to yeah. use up all the five minutes. So uh, no, five minutes yeah. is the upper limit. It didn't even actually technically have to be about Python. One of the one of my favorite lightning talks I ever saw uh, was uh, Sagarshan and Vera gave this whole talk at one conference about memes and the types of memes. And mm -hmm. I was in stitches. It was hilarious. Um, yeah, it's, remember the tracker jokes? Oh, yeah, maybe it's, uh, it's Euro Python. So, like, uh, we we have usually we have a uh, um, Mark Smith who is like the host of the Lightning Talk. He would just give uh, tracker jokes when people are setting up their computer, you know, parking. <laughs> he would just give uh, tracker jokes. So, yeah. I feel stupid. I don't know what a tractor joke is. Tractor. It's it's just like any any jokes that re uh, involve a tractor. So, for example, I can't. I is I'm not good at that. I can't remember anything. But okay. it's just very. Some of them are like very lame <laughs> joke, to be honest. But it's just any jokes involving a tractor. Like okay. I, I so think it's exactly what it says on the tin. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know if any of you know a joke that uh, related to a tractor. You can post pose it in the in the comment section so we know what is a tractor joke. Please, um, yeah. yeah, I may be able to look at one. <laughs> yeah, may maybe may it's probably terrible. No, it's funny the, all the different ways. One fascinating thing I've done before is I've actually watched uh, stand-up comedians in other languages. Like I didn't I didn't understand a word they were saying, but it's funny listening to a stand-up comedian in another language because you realize how much humor it has nothing to do with what's being said. It's, yeah, uh, it's just the delivery, and you're laughing right along with it. You have no idea what the joke was, but it's funny. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Just you just laugh along. Like when I first go to the UK, um, I try to go to some uh, comedy club or something, right? And you know, British humor sometimes could be quite different from mm. you know other countries. So um, oh. yeah, like I found it quite difficult. But luckily in London, we have a comedian from all over the world. So. 
I remember there was a a, a a Russian guy who is like who's super funny. Like you you think that Russian guy is super funny, and there's also another German guy. You know, like people think that Germans are not funny, but they. Oh, actually... German humor is great. It's, yeah. it's, Look at Martin. He, like he's super funny. I mean, he's like... hilarious. Yeah. yeah. No, I love I love German humor too because it's it's usually the, 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 the Germans invented the anti joke. Which is funny because it shouldn't be funny. Like there's something non sequitur where the punchline's supposed to go, and that alone makes it funny. Uh, case in point, my favorite German joke is uh, two peanuts are walking across the bridge. One fell in, the other name is Helmut. It's like yeah. that's the joke. Yeah, and I find... you kind of get the crickets. It's like what? But that's that's what makes it funny to them is the fact that there's something random is a non sequitur instead of a. You have this whole setup, and you're waiting for something hilarious, and you get you know. To get to the other side, that that the chicken joke is a great example of this. Yeah, I I just I just I just don't know. Like I have okay, let me let me put the banner in, like in case people are like, why are we talking about jokes? Oh, yeah, about humor, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. trying exactly. to fill in exactly. time here. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like we have actual know. talks coming. <laughs> <laughs> there is a talk coming. Don't worry, we are just like filling up the time right now. Like, exactly. uh, like all, like, all good hosts are doing is to make yeah. sure that there are contents to fill all the gaps and stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, that's um, okay. I mean, there, how many morning shows do this? I mean, it's okay. Yeah, and this I'm sorry, qualifies we don't have as a morning show in some parts of the world. <laughs> yeah, um, but. Yeah, is 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 is. Uh, I don't know. I I used to go to comedy club a lot, and um, but I I sometimes I don't get the joke. Like sometimes there will be four comedian on stage. You know, for those three gigs, usually it's like up and coming comedians, right? They they're not well known. Um, they're just like trying new material. So sometimes it's a hit or miss. So like there will be four person on stage, and usually I found it like half and half. So it's like really like fifty percent hit or miss. Where I find it funny, so but some people may think that's funny, but I don't think you know cultural difference. <laughs> yeah, humor is very relative. You know, I, I should find an excuse at some point to do so. I do stand up comedy too, actually, but I mm. hard time finding gigs because I have a life um, aside from that, so it sucks up all my bandwidth, and then I don't have any gigs. Yeah, <sighs> I think we should have a collection of Python jokes or something. I think we do have a Twitter uh, of uh, Python jokes or, or geek jokes or something. Yeah. I can't remember the name now, but uh, I think there's a Twitter account of that kind of thing that they, they tweet. I think they, they must have a bot somewhere like, yeah. that is, like tweeting about jokes like once in a while or something like that. Um, yeah. Well, I, I haven't been, I fell off the wagon this year, but like usually I post a new original pun every Monday. On my, so if you like really bad dad jokes, <laughs> that's my that's my thing on Twitter. So if you follow me at Codemouse92 on Twitter, you will get so like, for example, the, the the ghosts in my basement prefer wearing towels. They claim that they're more terrifying. <laughs> yeah, please like and subscribe. Oh, that way. Like and subscribe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Whichever way that button is. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh now we are actually going uh, more deep and deep into uh, you know sleeping song for, for European uh, conference goers, including me, but uh, but I, I drank too much coffee, so I'm, I'm okay, good to go. Um, so I don't know whether we have new people joining, like maybe you're in a different time zone. Uh, oh, I think it's still quite early for um, Asia Pacific uh, friends over there. So Everybody in California is just getting off work, so, oh no, that's right, they won't be working on Saturday. <laughs> You forget it's Saturday. This is I don't know. All the days run together are. anymore. I don't know what day it is. It's Feasel Day, you know. 32nd yeah. of February. Yeah, I don't know how, how they so because like when I think about pajamas, it's 24 hours stream. I I I'm also a uh, I'm not a gamer, but I love watching games. So there's a thing called Games Done Quick. Some of you may know, uh gamers are there. Um so they have like before COVID, they have like actually events twice per year or something like that or now mm. it's like i think before covid there's even more they have like different but the idea was like they would have a week of uh they would have a they, they have a venue though like they have a hotel or something but mm. they would have people there um you know uh playing games uh you know they're done quick right so they are speed runners they they try to get the the, the game to be finished very very quickly um and then they would stream it, right? They, they, it's a marathon. Like they would have mm -hmm. games after games. Some games are like longer to 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 speed run, like to three hours, the very long ones, or sometimes like fifteen minutes or something like that, or five seconds. I don't know. Um, that uh, yeah, that they actually um, 
you know, they, they're, they're doing it nonstop. So sometimes they will have a time that is like, but the local time is kind of in the middle of the night, but people will still be playing games. And I was quite surprised, like how, how you can sustain that. Like they must have like, that's why they have it in a hotel. And then I'm sure that like, they would try to you know, book a hotel room there to uh, just pop okay, up and down, just to like, oh, go to play games. Like, oh, go back to sleep. <laughs> yeah, something like, something like that here. Yeah, so so I take it. Yeah, I take it. You're uh, you're with me for this ride for a while, then, because caffeinated yeah. yourself up. Ooh, that's that's your talk. Yay! Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. I have another one. So yeah, that's good. Uh, yeah. So it looks like we have six people on the stream right now, and then uh, we're gonna have. Uh, yeah, I'm sure everyone watching this later on too. So yeah, um, yeah, it should be fun. But uh, we should probably uh, go to a message break and then uh, get rolling on this next talk. So. See you in a few. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you for joining us, everybody. And uh, up uh, next here, we have uh, advanced machine learning time series forecasting methods. Um, that's a mouthful, but um, machine learning, you know. So uh, all you uh, ML fans out there, here's uh, that talk. My name is Paweł Skrzypak, and today, together with my colleague, Anja Barno, I will tell you or we will tell you a bit more about the uh, advanced machine learning time series forecasting methods. Together with Anya, we are working on the time series methods for quite a long time using the latest advancement in that uh, field. So I hope it would be valuable uh, for you. Uh, I will start briefly with the, some slides, uh, with the theoretical introduction to some methods. And after that, Anya will make um, a hands-on session and show in live practically how to use time series forecasting method. I will tell briefly about what the time series is, what are the uh, previous uh, method for the time series forecasting, the breakthrough, uh, which was done during the M4 competition when the machine learning method start to dominate the time series forecasting, and then go through the sum of the methods, uh, the, 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 the most advanced one. And Anya will tell a bit more um, uh, about the other methods used in the hands-on session. Uh, so till the M4 competition, so to the 2017, uh, the time series forecasting was dominated by the statistical methods, the famous ARMA, RIMA, exponential smoothing, ARCH, GARCH, theta method, and many, many more. Yeah. Uh, also, the ensemble of the different method uh, was were used quite heavily, and everything changed in the 2017. And there was a famous competition, M competition, the most prestigious competition in the time series forecasting. It is organized and led by the professor Spiros Makridiakis. He is a legend in the time series forecasting. And this competition has been won by the ES hybrid method, um, the method invented by Swabek Smil. I will tell a bit more about that. The second place also was uh, taken by the hybrid method. And since that time, the machine learning method dominated the time series forecasting competition and not only the competition. 
uh, ES hybrid, exponential smoothing hybrid method invented by the Polish um, uh, scientist uh, Sławek uh, Smil. Uh, it's a very unique method which uses a neural network, LSTM neural network, but with the uh, innovative and original architecture and exponential smoothing for the data preprocessing. And the very innovative thing is that the parameters of the preprocessing and parameters of the neural network are trained together in the one big backpropagation process. Um, the second thing is that the architecture of the neural network is very innovative, at least it was on that time. I will tell that more on the next slide. And uh, ES Hybrid uses ensembling in a very innovative way to create a different set of the net um, of the models, the best models for each of the time series and to use that time series models for forecasting. As I said, uh, the, the ES hybrid uses the LSTM networks, but not just simple LSTM, but with the residual connection, uh, with the dilatation and with the attention. Residual and dilation is known from the convolutional neural network used uh, very intensively for image recognition. And uh, it was used first time probably or at least first time so successfully uh, for the time series forecasting. And also uh, Swabek used the um, uh, attention, the LSTM attention, which was a very good cho choice and the ES hybrid method won with the very solid margin over the other, other methods. The next method which I wanted to mention is the NBITS. It's the fully machine learning methods with the very unique architecture. Uh, I will show that on the next slide. Uh, uh, there are different type of the blocks for the trends, seasonality, generic and other effects. And thanks to that, this method can catch very difficult time series and predict with the high accuracy. Uh, also, it contains some elements of the explainability and transfer learning and also uh, uses advanced uh, models ensembly. Uh, it can ensemble up to 100 or over 100 models to achieve the, the final prediction. And the architecture is uh, constructed from the blocks. Uh, we have the stacks, each stack uh, contains the blocks and uh, final um, forecasting is done from, from the different uh, forecasting from the different uh, stacks and different blocks. So in fact, it is a very, very heavily using on of ensembling. Next method, or rather the package of the method, is the Gluon TS. Um, it is available as a library. Also, it can be used for the uh, with the cloud computing training and inference. Uh, and it contains different forecasting method and different transformation method. Uh, and they can be used freely within that package. So on this slide, you can see the different forecasting method different neural network structures and different way of the determining the probabilistic distribution of the data. And good thing uh, about the gluon comparing to the other uh, previously mentioned method is that it is available as a library, as a package, so quite uh, easy to use and has also a very strong community uh, supports probably it is the best choice at the beginning. And the last method, uh, of course, but not least, is that Zeppelin machines. And this is different method comparing to previously presented one. Uh, this method not uses the neural network, but so-called stochastic learning automata algorithm. This algorithm has been invented in the 60s of the previous century, century by the Russian scientist called Zeppelin. Uh, 
and uh, currently it started to be rediscovered and used for the different uh, proposals because the biggest advantage is that this algorithm is modeling the probabilistic distribution of the given um, uh, in that case, time series, and the predictions are not deterministic, but uh, stochastic, and they are dynamically managed. So the algorithm is continuously le learning and shaping this probabilistic distribution. So for each of the parameter, we have the separate distribution, separate probabilistic distribution, which is learned during the training period and continuously learned during the prediction and the final final uh, outcome from the, the model is uh, sampling from the different distribution based on the values of the parameters and finally combine in the, in the predicted value. So the difference comparing to the neural network is that that settling machine is stochastic. So each prediction is uh, uh, could be different than, uh, than the, the, the next prediction. It's a different difference comparing to the neural network because in neural network the predictic predictions are deterministic and in settling machine not. But the advantages are that uh, settling machine is especially useful to learn uh, and predict um, time series with the high level of noise. Yeah, so difficult to, to predict. Oh, that's the methods. Anya will tell about also the temporal fusion transformer and will show the, the, the temporal fusion transformer and end bits in practice. So you can um, see how it works. Uh, very shortly summary. So we currently observe the dynamic development of the new time series forecasting method and they have uh, the new machine learning based forecasting method and the efficiency accuracy of prediction is much higher than um, statistical method. Of course, there are many areas of application for the time series method, for example, for the time series, financial time series forecasting, it is possible to achieve with this machine learning method accuracy over 60% for a long time, which is just simply not possible with the statistical method. That's all from my part. Uh, now Anya will show a uh, hands-on session and how to work with the time series. Hello, after the theoretical introduction, I would like to show something practical. I would like to present how we struggle with time series data on a daily basis. I will talk shortly about the data, the data processing models choice, models evaluation, boosting accuracy, and explainable AI, which can be used with time series data. And to have some examples, I chose a publicly available data set. The selection criteria were multidimensionality, difficulty, and data size. And I will briefly show how, what can be done with such data. So as I mentioned before, these data are open sourced. There is around 40,000 of rows each for one timestamp frequency of the data is one hour and we have around 15 columns six main uh, air pollutants six connected to, connected with weather and the rest express the date uh, here we have some example columns plotted uh, as we can see data look messy we have large amplitudes uh, after zooming data plot it looks slightly better however there is no visible pattern at the first sight uh, only after aggregation example over a week you can see some regularities and normally now we would do some explanatory data analysis etc however we don't have as much time so we will focus only on parts which are absolutely necessary which are crucial for for modeling. So one of the first things which needs to be done is handling the missing data. Firstly, we need to understand the source of missingness. Does it occur regularly? What are the largest gaps between consecutive not nuns values? Here I have plotted some missing data statistics. Starting from basic bear plot, as you can see, many columns do not contain any nuns. 
but there exist columns with significant amount of missing values, such as carbon monoxide. Next, heat map. Heat map helps us determine which occurrences of NANs in different columns are co correlated. We can see a strong correlation of columns describing the weather, such as pressure or temperature. Correlation of occurrences of missing values in different columns might be also expressed with dendogram here. And apart from basic statistics and correlations, we can check the distribution for specific columns. We can select column. And here we have length of consecutive nuns histogram. As we can see in this example, most of consecutive nuns sequences are short. However, series as long as 60 also exist. And the red plot shows the length of gaps between missing values. So if it was a straight line, that would mean that none missing values occur regularly. They do not in this case. So now we need to handle the missing data. We could apply standard basic methods like backward filling, linear or polynomial interpolation. We could also use more advanced methods, for example, based on machine learning models. Here we have example. In the plot, we can see fragment of one of time series. For visualization purposes, we can artificially increase number of missiles. We can select the percentage of values which will be randomly removed and see how different simple input imputation methods will fill these values. So starting from forward filling, through linear interpolation, to spline with the higher order, which will give us smoother curve. From analysis of missing values, we know that in our case, sometimes the gap between two not missing values is very large. Here we have plotted example. We will not insert anything in that case, but just split series into two shorter series. Second thing which needs to be done are data transformations. This step is crucial for some statistical models which require often series in specific format, for example, stationary. Uh, for more advanced models, it's often not essential, but may also help with numerical issues. Here we have listed some basic transformations which can be applied for time series. And we can see how our series would look after the given transformation. We can also use more advanced transformations like embeddings. Example of simple but effective time transformation is encoding cyclical features like hours, days, etc. into a unit circle. Like in the presented GIF, and uh, for that, we, will, we are using uh, this formula. So before the modeling for our task, we will fill missing values with linear interpolation, normalize features. Sometimes we will use also Box-Cox transformation and encode cyclical features into a unit circle. In our case, hours and days. And for modeling, we choose one column, nitrogen dioxide, and prediction horizon equal to six. And firstly, we will train baselines and simpler statistical models to have some point of reference. And then we will move to neural networks methods. And uh, before, uh, before the models results, uh, a few words about the training setup. We we'll use train validation and test split. And for evaluation, we we'll use rolling window. Uh, here we have plotted train validation test splits. And we will start with extremely simple models, naive predictors. 
it's good to always look at them in time series forecasting. They are very, very easy to use. And it often happens that the metrics, graphs, results, statistics of, of our model look okay at the first glance, but then it turns out that the, the prediction is better and our model is worthless. So it's, it's always uh, it's a good practice to start uh, first with, with naive prediction. And it's uh, worth to mention that uh, some alternatives for naive predictors uh, would be uh, usage of metrics like mean absolute scaled error. And uh, apart from uh, baby baselines, we will also train some classical models, for example, Sarima, Prophet, Tibet, or exponential time series. It's moving. And uh, these models will be fine-tuned with rolling window, with hyperparameters grid search or Bayesian-based hyperparameter search. Okay, so as we have seasonal data, we we'll use two naive predictors, last value repetition and repetition of values from the previous day with the same hour. And here are the results. Uh, we compare them later with other methods. And for advanced neural networks models, we will cho we'll choose two methods, a temporal fusion transformer and NBs. Both uh, of them are the state of the art models and they have, uh, but they have different advantages and complete each other very well. In this picture, we can see architecture of temporal fusion transformer. And as you can see, it's quite complicated, uh, but we will not talk about the technical details. We will focus on advantage of this model. So first of all, good results according to the paper, comparing to statistical and neural network models. Uh, the very, very big advantage of uh, temporal fusion transformers is the fact that it works with multivariate time series with different types of data, like categorical, continuous, or static. Uh, temporal fusion transformer it has also implemented variable selection networks, so it, it allows us to uh, save time during the data processing. Uh, its results are interpretable, thanks to attention mechanism. Uh, and it, well, it also works with known feature inputs, and that allows us uh, creating conditional predictions. In general, uh, it's applicable without modification to a wide range of problems, and we can obtain some explainable predictions. And the second chosen model was NBits, and NBits uh, outperformed the winner model from prestigious and for competition. Uh, it means that it achieved the highest scores on 100,000 time series from different domains. So it's uh, a batch of quality. It's designed for univariate time series. Uh, its results are also interpretable, but uh, thanks to special models which, which try to explain the trend and seasonality. And to sum up, TFT and, and NBITS both uh, have very good scores and try to deliver interpretable predictions, but are optimized for different types of data. Uh, NBIT is uh, optimized for univariate time series and uh, TFT is optimized for any type of time series with any type of data, of, with any types of data. Okay, so for neural network training, we use early stopping, learning rate scheduler and gradient clipping. And sometimes, but not in 
this case, we use uh, also Bayesian based framework like Optuna for hyperparameters and networks architecture optimization. Okay, so let's move to results. Uh, the accurate matrix results will be presented later in the table, but here we have some GIF for n bit performance on the test set. And this gray rectangle represents the prediction horizon, so its width uh, is equal to 6, because our, our horizon uh, is uh, equal to 6 hours. And the same GIF was delivered for TFT. And data are noisy, but predictions sometimes look, look okay. Uh, model often correctly predicts future forecast direction, which is good. And here are some predictions for TFT from test set, uh, which are actually very good and uh, they were selected randomly, but luckily we, we, mm, we ran uh, very uh, good samples. Uh, for sure, there are also worse examples in this test set. And here we have table with different experiments uh, with TFT and n bits and different loss functions, different, lo different loss functions for regression problem. And uh, here we have also matrix results, like typical uh, matrix for uh, regressions, like mix, mean absolute error or mean uh, average percentage error, etc. And the best scores uh, are highlighted in green. At and as we can see, temporal fusion transformer uh, with quantile loss scored the best. Uh, mean average error for naive prediction for, for naive predictors uh, uh, were around 25. So our neural networks clearly learn anything and uh, are um, significantly better than than uh, naive predictions. And the next question is, can we do better? Of course, we can try to optimize hyper parameters uh, or network architecture, uh, but there is one thing which requires less time and is extremely effective, ensembling. Even models with the same architecture trained with different loss function, input length, training hyperparameters or transformation can contribute to score improvement in assembling. And here we have, uh, here we have a proof. Uh, this ex these are experiments with TFT uh, or n bits and uh, differing only in loss function. So, uh, for example, we uh, used quantile loss or mean absolute uh, error loss or root mean square error loss uh, or uh, new loss function delayed loss, which is, which is, uh, which is, which is different than uh, the, this, which is significantly different than this uh, other loss, losses. And we end up with uh, over 15 percentage of mean absolute error improvement over the best single model. And even single models with low score, like this one, TFT with delayed loss, the worst model from all experiments with TFT, contributes positively to score improvement. And as I mentioned, both TFT and NBIT aim to give explainable predictions. And here we have results obtained from TFT. First plot shows the values importance in time. So the higher is the value here, the more important was that time point during, during the predictions. Uh, in this case, the most influential data were measured 168 hours. 
so seven days before the prediction time. So it means that it suggests that we can have weak seasonality here. And here we have features importance from variable selection submodule. As expected, the most important feature is nit nitrogen dioxide, uh, so our target. And decoder variable importance plot for feature, feature known values like those connected with time. So it shows uh, which, which features were the most uh, important uh, from the known feature inputs. With small modification of architecture, we can also see which features were the most important for specific timestamp. Uh, as I mentioned, to obtain such result, we need to slightly change architecture. So there is no guarantee that model week will work as good as the original one on any type of data, but for some examples, it also works. Uh, it uses, uh, this, it relies on the same, same uh, mechanism like, like the original TFT. So it uses uh, attention, attention layer for, uh, for explain, explainability. Okay, and that's uh, all. Thank you all for attention. All right. Uh, so uh, we got some more talks coming up here. That was uh, advanced machine learning. Uh, we're going to be uh, uh, we're going to be heading in here into designing websites with privacy in mind. Uh, we we'll start that in about five minutes. So uh, uh, hang out, and then uh, later on we got cruelty free critiques um, and security considerations in Python packaging. Uh, by the way, if you haven't yet, make sure that you check out our Discord. Uh, we have the link over there in the. Uh, uh, which way do I have to point? See, this is always hard when you're, when you're doing this. So uh, over here in chat, um, we have the links there as well uh, to join the Discord if you haven't already. Um, we have a giveaway for uh, an awesome book um, So uh, from Packet. So um, sign up to, uh, there I go, pointing the wrong way again. So there, over there, <laughs> sign up uh, for that at that link. Um, it's also down there in the ticker. Um, and we also have lightning talks coming up. Um, so sign up if you want to do one of those, just five minute talks on whatever, five minutes or less, whatever you want. No slide deck, no preparation, no plan required, just some fun. So um, you can talk about whatever you like, basically. Uh, so yeah, uh, sign up there. Those are always fun. Uh, so we're going to go to a quick break and uh, you can fill up your coffee. And then we're going to come back for this talk on designing websites with privacy in mind. So stay tuned. Pajamas. This is the Quiet Storm. Uh, this is your host, DJ Codemouse92, bringing you the smoothest Python talks in the no universe. Uh, coming up uh, next, we have uh, designing websites with privacy in mind. Later on, we got cruelty free critiques, security considerations in Python packaging, and all other manner of cool, smooth talks coming up. 
uh, be sure to be sure to join the conversation over here on our Discord. Uh, the link is in the uh, chat or in the ticker below. And sign up for this book giveaway and for Lightning Talks later on in the conference. Uh, so let's uh, flip some uh, cool jazz here with uh, this talk on designing websites with privacy in mind. Thank you so much for joining my talk, Designing Websites with Privacy in Mind. Um, today I'll talk to you about, uh, first, why you should keep privacy in mind when designing websites. What is privacy by design? And we'll also go through the principles of this concept, some examples of what not to do, some examples of best practices, and I'll also share some tips with you when it comes to designing websites. Um, before we start, I do have a couple of disclaimers. Um, so first, anything that we talk about today is not going to be um, considered legal advice and is presented for informational purposes only. And also, I'm a privacy lawyer, I'm not a designer. So while I'm good at telling you about the principles of privacy by design, it is up to you to make those principles actually look beautiful and work your magic on the actual website. So a little bit about me. I'm a privacy and technology attorney licensed in Illinois. I'm also a certified information privacy professional, and I'm the president and legal engineer of Termageddon, um, a software as a service that has generated thousands of privacy policies and kept them up to date with changing legislation. Um, I'm also the chair of the American Bar Association's e-privacy committee and the chair of the Chicago chapter of the International Association of Privacy Professionals. And I'm very excited to talk to you about, uh, to talk to you today about how to keep um, privacy in mind when designing websites. All right, so let's get started. Um, you're here today because you design websites, whether as a freelancer, a part of an agency, or a part of a company. Um, privacy wasn't really such a big deal five to 10 years ago, so you may be wondering why you should keep privacy in mind when designing websites and what has changed. So really, consumers are increasingly becoming interested in their privacy online. Um, ever since the Cambridge Analytica scandal, consumers have opened their eyes to the dangers of sharing their personal information online. In fact, consumers are pressuring legislators um, to pass privacy laws. And in the last year alone, we saw two new privacy laws pass, um, both in Virginia and Colorado. As more privacy laws pass, the privacy requirements for websites are increasing. In addition, um, certain privacy laws, such as the General Data Protection Regulation, GDPR, or the United Kingdom Data Protection Act of 2018, require data protection by design and by default. So these laws can apply to businesses outside of the European Union and outside of the United Kingdom, and noncompliance can actually lead to heavy fines for your clients. And lastly, while we can talk about fines and lawsuits, um, which is definitely something that's very important to consider, I also wanted to note um, that having a privacy conscious website can actually be a competitive advantage for your clients. So in fact, a recent study by Axios found that 93% of Americans would switch to a company that prioritizes data privacy. So a privacy focused website can actually help your clients do better in business. So that's why it's really important to keep in mind as well. Um, so this is kind of a, a very intense slide, um, and I won't go through all of this. Um, but in the U.S., we don't have a federal privacy law that governs the collection of personal information on websites, unless you're in healthcare um, or the finance industry, or you're collecting the personal information from children under the age of 13. So each state is proposing and passing their own privacy laws. In the slide, you'll see our privacy bill tracker, which is also available on termageddon.com slash blog, that lists all of the proposed privacy bills in the United States right now. So I won't go through each of these um, right now just because I don't want to bore you to death, um, but there are some things um, about this bill that about these bills that I think that you should be aware of. So if passed, all of these bills would, would apply to businesses outside of the states in which the bills are passed. So for example, one of New York's privacy bills would apply to any business, regardless of its size, um, located anywhere that collects the personal information of residents of New York. 
Um, most bills would apply to businesses regardless of their size, meaning that they would apply to small businesses as well as, as, well as larger businesses. And some bills would allow consumers to sue businesses directly for privacy law violations. Those of you that have been tracking the Americans with Disabilities Act lawsuits know that when consumers are able to sue businesses directly, we see a really, really large influx of, uh, of lawsuits, right? So you wanna keep this in mind. Um, so with the amount of bills that are being passed, the privacy requirements for websites aren't going away um, and is not something that you can just ignore. So let's talk about who's responsible for website privacy. In an ideal world, your client would know all about the privacy requirements that they need to comply with, um, and they would provide you with a list of exactly what you need to do to make their website compliant. Unfortunately, those of us that have worked with clients in web design know that um, the world is very far from being perfect. Um, so in reality, most clients don't even know that their website is collecting personal information or that features such as Google Analytics have been installed and those features make them um, responsible uh, for complying with numerous privacy laws. So since you're the one implementing features that collect personal information, um, so you're the one that, are, that is designing these forms, you're the one that's implementing these analytics, you should, at a minimum, um, let your clients know that such features exist because most of the time they don't. Um, so since clients may not know this, um, you should tell them that they need to take privacy seriously because it not only helps your clients, but can actually help you protect yourself as well. And fines for privacy law non-compliance are actually very steep. Um, so they start from $2,500 per website visitor um, and can go up to 20 million euros or more in total. So if your client is fined, they may try to blame you um, for privacy law non-compliance on their website. And I think that you should tell your clients to sign a contract that puts the responsibility of compliance on the client and not on you, um, making it making it very clear that you do not guarantee compliance, uh, whether with privacy laws or any other laws when it comes to that particular website. So now that we've discussed the why, um, let's talk about the how. So privacy by design is a concept that is codified by a very smart woman by the name of Anne Kavukian, and it essentially ensures um, that the privacy of users is protected by integrating con considerations of privacy issues from the beginning of the project into development. Right, so privacy by design has seven foundational principles. Um, so we'll talk about these principles now and what they actually mean when it comes to the actual development um, and design of a particular website. So first, proactive, not reactive, preventative, not remedial. So privacy by design anticipates and prevents privacy invasive events before they happen. So a great example of this, let's say that you're designing a website that allows users to create an account. Very common on a website, people log in to view their billing, make payments, um, you know, review their past purchases, things like that. So as people forget their passwords, you will need a way for users to reset those passwords, right? People forget their passwords all the time. On the research, reset password page, you have users enter their emails, but if they write the wrong email, um, will the screen notify a user that they registered with a different email? So if you do decide to do that, um, that could potentially become a privacy violation as scammers could easily run a bunch of emails through this page to determine who has an account on that website and then try to hack that account. So this is a great example of being proactive and using design to prevent privacy violations by not notifying that person that they already have an account or that they have an account with a different email um, and instead allowing people to res reset their passwords without that notification. Second, um, we have privacy as the default setting. Privacy by design seeks to deliver the maximum degree of privacy by ensuring that personal information is automatically protected without the individual having to take any action to preserve their privacy. Great example of this, users should not be opted in to email marketing lists by default. Um, they should have to affirmatively opt in if they want to. So those screens where you, know, you sign up for an account um, or you make a purchase and then you're automatically added to a marketing list, um, that would actually be against privacy by uh, design principles because in reality, privacy is the default setting would mean that they are not automatically added to any particular list, that they would have to affirmatively check a box if they want to be added to that list. 
The third principle of privacy by design is privacy embedded into design. So what that means is that privacy should be embedded into the design and architecture of IT systems and business practices. Privacy should be an integral component of the core functionality being delivered and should not be bolted as an add-on after the fact. This is a great example too when choosing plugins. Um, don't pick plugins at random without concern of the privacy impacts of such plugins and then slap on a cookie consent mechanism on the website and call it a day. So you should first um, make sure that any technologies that you install onto the website are privacy conscious before installing them. In addition, you should let your clients know exactly what plugins or technologies you are implementing on the website because those technologies could make the client subject to various privacy laws. Um, so privacy laws often require websites to have a privacy policy that lists what kind of personal information is collected, what is done with that information, and who it's shared with. So if you don't tell your client what plugins are included into the website, they cannot have a compliant privacy policy because they don't know what personal information those plugins collect, how they use them, and who they share them with. So making sure that you provide a list of the, for the client of the plugins that you chose, um, and also making sure that you choose those plugins carefully, not just by uh, what those plugins do for the website, but also whether or not those plugins are privacy conscious. So the fourth um, foundational principle of privacy by design is full functionality, positive sum, not zero sum. So this may be surprising to some of you, but privacy by design shows us that it is possible to have privacy and security and create a win-win scenario by having both. So for example, um, and I don't mean to call Facebook out on this, um, if you are enabling two-factor authentication for security, you can also preserve privacy of that customer by not adding the two-factor information to an email marketing list like Facebook did. So making sure that that information is private, that people have to actively opt in to marketing um, or any kind of list where you sell their personal information to advertisers, things like that, um, that will make sure that you are preserving privacy, but also having security at the same time. The fifth principle of privacy by design is end-to-end -end security, full lifecycle pr protection. So privacy should start prior to the information being collected and should continue throughout the entire life cycle of that information through collection, use, retention, and destruction of that information. So for example, a lot of companies keep information forever, which can put them at risk um, of data breaches and make such data breaches uh, more costly. In addition, various privacy laws such as GDPR and UK DPA um, actually prohibit companies from keeping information forever as well. So you should talk to your clients about automatic data deletion after a certain period of time has passed from the collection so that they're never keeping information indefinitely, especially if they no longer need that information to contact the customer um, or if the uh, customer has opted out of emails, um, you know, their email should be deleted then. The sixth principle of privacy by design is visibility and transparency, keeping it open. So privacy features and settings should be visible and easy to find for users. In addition, companies need to have a comprehensive privacy policy that users can easily find. So we'll actually talk about how to achieve this um, in a few minutes, how to make sure that your privacy information is very easy to find and is visible to consumers. And then lastly, respect for user privacy, uh, keep it user centric. So privacy by design requires designers to keep the interests of the user uppermost by offering strong privacy defaults, appropriate notice and empowering user friendly um, choices. So make sure that the website gets consent for the collection, use and sharing of personal information, provide accurate and up to date privacy information and comply with all of the applicable privacy laws. So that really brings us to the conclusion of what privacy by design is and what these principles mean. Um, but I know that some of this may be really confusing and, um, you know, it's all probably new to you. Um, so I think that the next best thing for us to do is to look at um, what this really looks like in practice, right? What does this look like on a website? What are some things that you should do and what are some things that you shouldn't do? 
So let's talk about how to put the principles of privacy into design um, by first talking about what you shouldn't do. So on the, on the left, you'll see a cookie consent form. So if a website has one of these, that means that they need to obtain consent for the collection of certain cookies um, or for the enabling of certain technologies under G GDPR, the UK DPA, um, or the e-privacy directive. So these laws require websites to provide users um, with an actual choice, meaning that there must be an accept and a decline button. So here on the left, you'll see that there is no decline button. There's only an accept all cookies button and a manage preferences button. So cookie consent forms like this are really not compliant um, and they should not be used. So when you're installing a cookie consent mechanism on a website, be very careful um, and make sure that the cookie consent form that you're using is actually compliant. Obviously make sure that the client reviews this as well and can verify that it's compliant too. So on the right, you'll see a checkout form. So it's just a basket where somebody is purchasing a vehicle check. So probably something um, considering, um, you know, repairs of vehicles. So if you don't click more info on that page, um, you actually don't see any information, right? You're just accepting a terms of service, um, which is pretty common with an e-commerce transaction. There's really no indication that you're agreeing to anything other than the terms of service. But if you do click the more info button, which most consumers won't do because really there's no reason for them to do that, um, you'll see that they're actually signing up to emails from third parties, uh, which is really not cool. Uh, so that form is, that section is enabled by default, right? So unless you click more info and unselect that, you're going to have your email automatically shared with third parties. Um, so you should really make sure that privacy information like this is not hidden from consumers and that users have an actual choice um, and can actually opt into marketing emails and not have to opt out of them, especially when it comes to um, those marketing emails being sent from third parties, uh, which is a, an unpleasant surprise for consumers and can actually be a violation of multiple privacy laws as well. On the left here on this page, um, you'll see a contact form, right? So contact forms are very common. Um, you know, people enter their name, email, and a message, making sure, and then, you know, that information is sent to the business and the business can answer their inquiry, right? So privacy by design teaches us that privacy information should be presented to users whenever personal information is collected, like here on a form. Um, multiple privacy laws can also require websites to obtain consent whenever that information is collected. So contact forms should have a checkbox to agree to privacy policy, um, which this form doesn't have. Um, and the checkbox should be unchecked by default and users should be required to check it before they can actually click submit. So here the issue with this form is that it's not presenting the user with a privacy policy that they can read. Um, and it's also not gathering consent uh, for collecting that information in the first place. And on the right, um, we see a footer of a website that has a link that says terms and privacy. Um, so multiple privacy laws state that a privacy policy should stand on its own and not be combined with any other information um, because combining it with other information basically negates consent because it combines too much information for the, for the consumer to be able to say, yes, I agree to the privacy policy or yes, I agree to the terms of service. So you can't have both at the same time. So you should really make sure that a privacy policy policy and a terms of service are not combined into one link like it is here. So let's talk about some of the best practices that we have here. Um, so on the left, you'll see um, our listing of our policies for my company, actually. As you can see, um, they're all separated and very clear. It's easy to see to consumers. Um, privacy information is not hidden or obscured in any way. So all of the policies are separated so you can read them separately. Um, and they're actually very, very apparent on the website. So. Privacy laws also dictate how the privacy policy link is displayed. So you have to make sure that you have contrasting colors from the background, um, contrasting text um, or bold text, something that is very, very clear to consumer, hey, this is the privacy policy that I need to read, right? So make sure that these are not obscured. So if your website um, website's footer is black and you have um, the link to the privacy policy slightly less black, so like really dark gray, so consumers can't see it. That's pretty much not having a privacy policy at all. 
Um, so make sure that your backgrounds are contrasting and that it's very, very easy to see and tell where the policies are. And on the right-hand side, you'll see a contact form um, that asks the user to input their name and email and a message. Um, and it has a link to agree to a privacy policy. So the privacy policy itself is clearly hyperlinked. So users can see that clearly, can click on it, can read the privacy information. The box is not ch uh, checked by default. So they have to affirmatively check the box and affirmatively agree to the privacy policy itself. And they're not allowed to submit the form without agreeing to the privacy policy. So that makes sure that you gather consent each time. And here on the best practices list as well, on the left, you can see a cookie consent form where only the necessary, uh, where only the essential cookies are enabled and all other cookies are disabled by default, right? And the user is given an actual choice um, whether or not to enable the cookies um, if they want to, right? So the analytics cookies, for example, those aren't necessary for the operation of the website. Um, so those are disabled by default. And then the user can toggle the on and off switch um, to decide whether or not they want to enable those cookies. And on the right, you'll see an app um, where privacy information is presented and the user is provided with very clear information about whether or not they want to allow that app to track them. So they can say allow tracking or ask the app not to track. And that provides the consumer with information as to whether or not they want to be tracked and whether or not they want um, those privacy settings to be enabled. So you really need to make sure to provide users with adequate notices and information at the relevant point in their customer journey. And then lastly, um, I did wanna give you some tips, um, some final tips uh, for how to design websites with privacy in mind. So first, do not collect more personal information than what is needed. Um, we see a lot of people collecting information and then they don't ever do anything with it. So, you know, what happens when somebody submits a contact form? Well, I never respond to them. Um, or, you know, I keep an email list, uh, but I never send them emails. Don't collect that information if you don't need it because collecting personal information is what puts you at risk of privacy fines, privacy lawsuits, data breaches, and it can increase the cost of data breaches as well. So unless you have a very clear use for that information, don't collect it. Um, make sure that you're ready to help clients in deleting personal information and honoring other privacy rights. As more and more privacy laws are being passed, um, clients will come to you saying, hey, I received a request um, to delete somebody's personal information. What do I do? Because in reality, most of your clients don't know how to access the back end of the website, right? They don't know how to delete information. So make sure that you have at least an understanding of how to delete information, um, how to access it, how to provide it in a portable format for consumers, um, because your clients will come to you this, um, will come to you for help with this. So make sure that you're ready. Um, explain to your clients what services the website will be using that collect personal information. So if you're installing forms, right, let's say you're installing um, an email newsletter form, a contact form, an account creation form, or you're adding analytics to the website, or you're adding any kinds of plugins that collect personal information, make sure you provide your clients with a list of those plugins, those forms, um, all of those features that collect personal information so that they can understand that these services are being used on the website and these services are, um, are subjecting them potentially to privacy laws, meaning that they need to have a privacy policy. So you don't necessarily need to know what all of the privacy laws are. Um, you don't necessarily need to know all the different acronyms, all the different rights and all the different obligations. What you really need to tell your clients is, hey, you know, I install these features on your website, they're collecting personal information. Um, I think you should look into having a privacy policy. So it doesn't have to be more complicated than that. Provide a way on the website to gather proper consent. Um, so if your client is subject to privacy laws that require them to get consent, make sure that the forms that you install on the website have that little checkbox, have a link to the privacy policy, um, that your client is actually providing a privacy policy to be added to that website, um, and make sure that you're having an appropriate cookie consent form as well. 
And then lastly, keep privacy requirements in mind when designing and developing websites. These requirements aren't going away. Um, so as time goes on, we'll actually see more and more privacy by design requirements that are applying to websites. So you need to make sure that you understand these concepts and that you're keeping them in mind um, when you're doing your job of designing and developing a website. Um, so if you have any questions, um, I'll be in the um, channel uh, for questions after this event. So feel free to ping me on there. Um, or if you think about any questions afterwards, uh, feel free to email me. My email is donata at termageddon.com. Thank you so much. Hello, hello, all you hip cats out there. This is DJ Codemouse92 rolling with you through the night on the quiet storm with the smoothest Python talks in the galaxy. Yeah, okay. So it's actually after, uh, it's, it's, it's after, it's uh, past dark here. So I'll you know, get a little ridiculous. I have to take these off. I actually can't see the screen with these on. Um, so yeah, I, um, that was an excellent, uh, very insightful talk on. Uh, how uh, to bake privacy into the design of a website. Um, taking mental notes and me implementing some of that myself. Um, so uh, if you have any questions, um, definitely uh, pop into the Discord channel. You can ask them out of there. Um, next up uh, after the break, um, just a few minute break here, but uh, next up we got cruelty free critiques. Uh, followed by security considerations in Python packaging. Uh, so uh, more security stuff, which is uh, really helpful. And then uh, later on, we have uh, using chaos toolkit to determine resiliency for your web app. So a little bit of chaos coming down the pipeline. That should be fun. Uh, so if you haven't already, make sure you join our Discord. And there is a link over here in the uh, chat and the comments section. Um, and uh, you can uh, also uh, register to uh, uh, for a chance to win a uh, Python book from Packet. There's a giveaway going on. And if you want to give a lightning talk, it's a great way to uh, uh, get out there and share ideas with others. It's five minutes or less, uh, no pressure. You can talk about whatever you like. Uh, so if you want to do that, it's a lot of fun. You can sign up there. Uh, so yeah. Um, this is going to be fun. Got some great talks coming up. Uh, so if you are uh, watching this uh, and you're getting ready for the next talk, now's a great time to go grab a cup of coffee. You've got about five minutes or a cup of tea, whatever your favorite cozy beverage is, maybe some hot chocolate, and uh, uh, grab a dog to cuddle with and uh, snuggle in for the next talk. So, um, yeah, we'll see you here uh, back in a few minutes for the... Laziest Python conference on the planet.
everyone. Um, we are uh, rolling along with uh, some more uh, Python talks uh, here at Pyjamas. So got something warm and cozy to drink and uh, got pajamas going on and I got my dogs handy. Uh, so our next speaker is actually me. Uh, <laughs> you know, the, the funny thing, you, know, you the, the, the advice for speakers, um, you know, just generically in the industry is like submit multiple talks to a conference. That way you have a good chance of getting at least one accepted. Well, I submitted two talks in accordance with that and both got accepted. So, hey, win-win. Uh, uh, so, yeah, I'm going to be uh, doing that in uh, just a moment, talking about uh, cruelty-free critiques. Um, and then uh, later on, security considerations in Python packaging is going to be coming up after that. So please stay tuned. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and jump into that now. And hopefully everything works beautifully. Excellent. All right. So as you already know, my name is Jason McDonald. I'm known rather ubiquitously around the internet as CodeMouse92. So you can find me at CodeMouse92.com. I'm a software engineer. Um, I major part of my career has been in mentoring um, uh, young software engineers, young developers, um, in their first uh, year or so of uh, getting into the industry, um, especially through the internship program that I run at Mousepaw Media. Uh, so I give a lot of feedback through that. Um, also, there's certainly plenty of code review going around at my uh, full-time job at Canonical. And um, I'm an author and a speaker. So that means I'm going to be receiving a lot of feedback on talks and books and articles and um, giving it as well, you know, because when you're an author, you're in critique groups, you're having to give that feedback at the same time. So feedback is really a major part of my career. And feedback is important. It's important for any craftsperson because it's how we improve and we make our work better. The difficulty is, as much as we like to pretend that we are these objective um, creatures that uh, never get uh, bent out of shape, uh, the fact is we're still emotional creatures at the end of the day. We still have, um, you know, our own hopes and dreams and fears, and we put so much of ourselves into our work, whether it's code or prose or whatever it is, that you know, getting that that critical feedback, while we know it's so important for making our work better, is still not always a fun experience. So, I have learned over the years a number of techniques for ensuring that my feedback is uh, constructive and more likely to be well received. Uh, None of this, mind you, is about, you know, making your feedback, you know, lighter or, you know, sugarcoating any of it. You know, we want to be very practical with feedback. It's important. But how you frame it can really have an impact on how effective that critique is. So um, the first thing you need to do is to recognize good faith effort. When someone uh, presents their work, they really probably do think that this is the best solution to a problem or that it's, um, you know, that it's, it's good work. They actually try to do a good job um, and they present it in that light. There's rare exceptions, but most of the time people are really trying to do a good job. So recognizing that first off the bat, this is all about making sure that before you even start formulating um that feedback that you have the right frame of mind, that this is a real person um, who really tried their best and you are helping them improve their work. You're not looking to um, give them a Rogers and Ebert two big thumbs down. Um, you want to help them improve. So framing it in that way ensures that you have the right attitude right off the bat. The second part is to actually read. This may seem pretty obvious, reading the code that you're reviewing or reading the prose that you're reviewing. Of course, you have to read it. But a lot of us like to skim. We're busy. You know, we have our own assignments we have to get done. We have to practice for that uh, talk at the conference. We have this meeting we have to be in for two hours with our boss. And we have all these things on our plate. And the last thing we want to be doing is taking uh, 30 minutes out of our lives to read somebody else's code. So we skim it. 
The problem is when you skim, you miss details. And those details sometimes can influence the information that you're going to be, the, the feedback you're going to be giving. And so it then falls to the author to correct you and say, well, no, if you look at this, I said it was actually this. Or I understand you think that, but if you look here, it's actually this thing here. Uh, they just waste time. Um, and even if you can work through all of that, there's that lingering doubt in the author's mind. Did they really read? Did they really pay attention? Um, even if they just, even if they do just assume that, that, that you read it, some of that feedback may not actually be appropriate. And even if they're just obeying your, your, um, your suggestions and implementing those, um, maybe some of those weren't actually great suggestions after all. And if you had slowed down, you would know that. So take the time to actually read. Now, this part of this is honesty. If you don't have the time to read, that's okay. But you need to be upfront with that. Say, hey, you know what? Um, I don't have the bandwidth for this right now. I'm going to let someone else take a look at it, or I'm going to take a look at this later. Uh, one of my coworkers at work, I asked him to review something. He said, sure, I can do that, but I'm going to wait till tomorrow morning so I'm fresh. I get a cup of tea and I can give this a proper read through. And I appreciated that. I didn't mind the delay because it meant I was going to get some real feedback from my coworker instead of just a cursory wave of the hand. So after you've read the work, the next step is to actually read it again. You just took half an hour to read it. Why would you want to read it a second time? You know, when do we get to the feedback part? But reading it again is so important because the first time you read it through, you're forming an opinion forming that first impression of the work. But that opinion doesn't have the whole picture in mind. There's surprises, maybe a, a twist in, in the implementation that you weren't expecting or something. And so you don't actually have all of the contents and the context. And it's very difficult to go back and revise it in your head. Or if you're actually reading it and leaving feedback as you read it for the first time, um, maybe you might forget to go up and edit a comment that you left earlier. So actually reading it through twice before you start giving feedback is very helpful. Um, if you are concerned about losing things, you can leave little notes for yourself. Or you can have draft comments. But then you make sure as you go through a second time, you're revising either your opinion, your, your thoughts on it, or the uh, draft comment as you're going through to make sure that you... Um, correct it based on the full picture ensures that your your feedback is high quality is not making assumptions about the work the fourth point is to see what they see and this is all about asking questions these aren't feedback questions these are very genuine um i want to learn questions so uh, wanting to, uh, you know, so asking what, what are you hoping to accomplish? That's one of my favorite questions to ask in the, in the uh, Python support room actually is, is what are you hoping to accomplish? Uh, Cause it gives me some insight in what, what are they trying to do? Where are they going with this? Because that's going to influence that feedback or what problems did you foresee? Uh, what use cases do you see for this? Asking genuine learning questions so that you can find out more. Uh, and what questions you ask and how many you ask really depends on the work and your familiarity with it. But part of this is recognize the good faith effort. There's a reason they did it this way. Let's find out more information. Once you've, once you've done that, then you are in a good place to be able to provide some high quality feedback. Uh, but you want to start with something positive. Now, I have been accused of being uh, disingenuous with this, um, but there is a very practical reason why we start positive. In fact, there's two practical reasons. First of all, is it's helpful for you as the person delivering the feedback. Again, it's very easy to get into this rut where we are just, you know, dumping on somebody else's work. I'm gonna look for every single flaw in this. And there's that little bit of ego that creeps in. I'm going to show everyone how smart I am with coding because I'm going to point out all the flaws with this code. Um, so by starting positive, this puts you in the right frame of mind. Um, again, recognizing good faith effort. So you look for something that is genuinely good. This is not about making something up or just throwing the, oh, this is a clever name. Ha -ha. You know, 
actually find something genuinely good about the work and start there. Leave a comment to that effect. That helps frame it in your mind as you were trying to improve the work, uh, help it be the best it can be, rather than just finding every possible problem with it. So starting positive. This is also helpful for the person who's going to be receiving your feedback because we're again, we're, we're, we are um, emotional beings. And as much as I, as an author and as a coder, want to improve, I don't like going through 40 pages of feedback on a chapter. And I have had 40 page chapters with 40 pages of feedback. It gets exhausting. But when I have that, that, that initial positive comment, like, you know what, I really liked how you explained this, or that was this, um, you, you have a very good concept here, or this is a nice example you're setting up. That is a really nice thing to see. And it, it reminds me, the author, that there's still value in my work and that the person giving the feedback wants to help make the work better, wants that value to really shine. So it helps me receive all of this constructive criticism because there is that initial positivity. Very helpful. Point six is to ask questions. Yeah, this is into feedback questions. There's two ways you can frame um, uh, a note of feedback. You might see that uh, in some code that the author used technique A. And you look at it and go, you know what? Should have used technique B. And uh, so you leave a comment to that effect. Don't use technique A in this case. It's much better to use technique, e, uh, technique B because of these reasons. Simple, to the point, blunt, done. But if you frame it as a question, you'll find it's going to be a lot more effective in many cases. Here's why. When it's phrased as an assertive statement, uh, first of all, it's going to, in most cases, going to put the author on a kind of an instinctual defense, no matter how much they're open to feedback. It's going to put them on the defense. I chose technique A. Um, I thought that was the right way to do that. So now let me defend why that's the right position. Uh, but the second problem is that if they're right and you're wrong, because we all make mistakes, then they now have to come back to you and say, hey, actually, technique A is right because of these reasons. And so there, it starts a little higher emotional temperature, as constructive as it is, a little higher than necessary. So if you frame it as a question, it changes the dynamic. I notice you use technique A here. Can you explain your reasons for using that technique? Usually I see technique B used for these reasons. Is there a reason why technique B would not work here? So by framing it in these forms of questions, you're actually inviting the author to engage with the feedback. Um, oh, okay. So the reason I use technique A is because of this reason. So you're actually inviting them to share their reasons for their approach. Uh, but even if you're correct, and they should instead be using technique B, the way they engage with that's going to be very different as well, because they're going to read that and they're going to think, hmm, you know, that's interesting. I haven't thought about that before. I think I like technique B. Now, because it was framed as a question, they can take ownership of this feedback and say, I think as the author that technique B is the way to go. I'm going to implement that. They've taken ownership instead of just obedience. Ownership is going, always going to produce better results. Um, the example I, uh, a recent example is, um, there was a process at work that, you know, one of my coworkers explained to me, you need to do X, Y, Z. And he said, you know, does that make sense? I said, not in the foggiest. I said, it's a ducks and watermelon situation. He says, what, what do you mean? I said, it feels like I'm being told, throw this watermelon at the third duck on the left. I don't have the foggiest idea why it's a watermelon, why I'm throwing it at the duck or what any of this has to do with the price of eggs. This doesn't make sense to me. I will do it, but it doesn't click. So I'm obeying, and this can happen with code reviews. Okay, he said to use this technique instead of that technique. All right, I'll just, I have no idea why, but he's more experienced than me, or she knows more about this than I do, so I'm just going to go ahead and implement that. And the trouble is, it's not necessarily going to be implemented the best way uh, because they're just obeying. Whereas when there's ownership, they think, hmm, why do I want to use technique B? And they're thinking about that, applying their own cognition 
to it and then incorporating that into their work voluntarily. And so there's going to be a better, um, there, there's going to be more ownership. So you're going to have a better result. And if they don't understand, they're going to feel more comfortable saying, hey, I don't understand this. What about this? What about that? So there's already that dialogue that has started. Uh, mindful of the time here, um, moving through these these points. Um, point seven is to know your own expectations. Just like it would be hard to do a code review for a language that you have never seen or used in your life, because you know, it's very hard to give that code review because you don't know what the good patterns are. You don't know what the techniques are. The same is true if you don't know what you want to see. This is very important, especially if you're working on a project. Um, what is it going to take for uh, a pull request, say, to win your approval? What do you need to see in that? Having a good understanding in your own mind of what that needs to be, and then expressing that through your feedback, what your expectations are. This is very important. Again, referring to a situation at work, I had a coworker who's really good about making sure that there's, there's good, solid commit messages. Um, very, very, he's very correct about it. And he's, he's very helpful in that regard. But for the longest time, um, it was not clear what a good commit message looked like in his estimation, what the cohesive picture was. Um, and of course, everyone else had their own opinions about what a good commit message was. We didn't really have a clear standard for this. So it would go something like this. One of us would create some work, upload it. Code looks great. He comes in and says, hey, commit message needs to be better, kicks it back to us. We're on a different time zone. Uh, you know, I'm, I'll make the change to the commit message, push it up, and it's the next day before it gets landed. And, it, and then it's like, oh, well, could you also change this? And it gets really frustrating. Once we were able to iron out what those expectations were, then it made a lot more sense. He understood what he was looking for, was able to communicate that to us. And we were able to come to an agreement on what a good commit message looked like. And so I'm able to write a good commit message and get approval right off the bat. So knowing your own expectations and then presenting that to others is very, a very important part about the feedback process, especially if you're regularly working with the author. Point eight is to focus on the work. This may seem fairly obvious, but it's very easy to slide into the habit of, of interpreting the work differently based on who wrote it. Uh, for example, uh, you are looking at some code written by someone who's been at the company and been at you know software engineering twice as long as you. Uh, they wrote pretty much the whole project that you're working on really, really smart. And you're looking at their code. They have a, you know, a pull request and you're supposed to review it. And you're going through there and you're thinking about, oh my gosh, this is that person. You start seeing things that don't make much sense. You think, wow, they're brilliant. They're on another level from me. And you wind your slip and it looks good to me on it and calling it good. And you miss the fact that actually those brilliant little things they have in there were actually mistakes. No, that, that asterisk is not some novel syntax in Python. That was a logic error. You know, and you didn't realize that. Senior engineers can make just as many, just as big mistakes, if not bigger mistakes than juniors. Senior engineers know more interesting patterns. Um, they can misapply them very easily. So seniors still need that same level of attention to detail. Conversely, you look at the junior's code and you think, ah, they don't know anywhere near as much as I do about this. This technique, oh, this is the wrong technique. You don't do it this way. You do it that way. And why are they doing this? And this is completely wrong. And as so you wind up picking apart every conceivable error, including things that actually weren't errors, maybe things that you didn't know about. It's very easy to fall into that too. So a very practical way to make sure you're focusing on the work and not the person is to kind of use your imagination a little bit. If you don't know anything about the person, by the way, this gets a lot easier. Um, in that case, just assume they know just as much about the code as you do and go through based on that. Don't frame your feedback that way, but just like when you're reading, assume that they're just as experienced as you are. If you're working with a senior engineer and you're reviewing their code, sometimes it helps to imagine, I like to imagine that, that they actually know less than me because I know they know more. So I like to imagine they know less than me. 
because my default is going to be to assume that they're smarter and that they have all this brilliant knowledge, things I can't even comprehend. So by assuming that they know less than me, but still framing things in the form of questions, I ensure that I am giving this a proper review. Did you intend to do this? Um, I haven't seen the syntax before. Can you explain it? Or um, have you considered this here? Framing things in forms of questions, but still challenging the work in the way that a code review should. Conversely, with a junior, I like to assume that they know as much or slightly more than me. Uh, and I'll do this with my interns. I'll assume that they're on the same level with me in terms of experience when I'm reviewing. And so if I come across some syntax I haven't seen before, I'll ask, hey, this is this is new. What what is this? What are you hoping this will do? And having that dialogue, assuming I'm going to learn something from this. I usually do. So focusing on the work, not the person. A couple more really quick. End positives. We started positive and we end positive. Some people like to call this a feedback sandwich. I have also been told it's a BS sandwich, which I would disagree with. Again, this is not about being disingenuous. It's very important to end positive because, again, as I've mentioned a couple of times, we are still emotional human beings. No matter how objective we can portray ourselves or how objective we believe we are, it still is tiring in the least to have a lot of feedback. You might be able to get away with skipping this if it's just a couple of nits, a couple of small things. But when there's a lot of feedback, it's very helpful to end positive. Again, from that book I'm working on, um, I would get back chapters that were just wall to wall red. I had to implement all those changes. And even if they started positive, by the time I get through the whole thing, it's, you know, that's distant memory. You know, and there's, I'm looking at now, I have to implement all of these changes. Now I'm used to this. I can do that. I'm happy to do it. But sometimes in the moment, I'm a little tired. You know, it's, there's a lot to take in. There's a lot to process. And then I see that note that's at the bottom. I really like that example. That explanation finally made sense to me. I appreciate that. Or that was a really funny way of framing that. I thought that analogy was, was, was hilarious. Good job. That little positive note gives me the, the extra boost to go back and implement those changes because this chapter, this code, whatever it is that I'm working on is worth it. If not just for that one thing that they pointed out, it is worth it. There is still value there and I want to make that really shine. Uh, I can't tell you how helpful that is, even though I'm very much used to implementing reams of changes with no positive comments having those positive comments makes my work so much easier. Finally, uh, providing reinforcements. Uh, you may think, okay, I've, I've submitted my, my feedback. I've reviewed the, 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 uh, the PR. I'm done. I'm good. See you later. Have a nice day. But remember, the author is probably still in it. Uh, they may have to get feedback from other people. Um, code reviews sometimes require two or three people to, to approve. Um, or the, that chapter may need to go through some additional edits. And so when you have the ability, stay tuned in to the process. If it's a GitHub PR, someone else has to take a look at it, just, you know, hit the little I watch that, keep an eye on the conversation, because there's inevitably going to be some sort of dialogue going on. And oftentimes there will be repeats of topics that have already come up. Um, maybe someone doesn't even know how to do feedback as well. Or even if they do, maybe they miss something that you had already discussed with the author. And so being able to come in and go, you know what? He explained why he was using technique B, and that makes a lot of sense. Or, you know what? Uh, she um, uh, already addressed that she was going to change this. So hang in there. That, that, that's going to come in the revision. You know, it saves that author a little bit of time. They don't have to now defend themselves again. You can help. Um, and sometimes it even helps push it over the line. It's like, this is an odd change. Well, actually, I rather liked it. I thought they did a good job. So having that little bit of reinforcement um, can be really helpful for the author and very encouraging. So do consider providing reinforcements when um, the situation arises that you can. So that is cruelty-free critiques in a nutshell. Um, again, this is not about sugarcoating feedback or, you know, making 
you know, just let's like make everything easy. You know, here's here's a here's a participation award. You did an amazing job. This is about let's make this. Let's, it's about framing this feedback so that the work gets better. And so the author walks away empowered to take ownership of the ideas and to really make the work shine. Um, so, you know, be direct, be honest, be truthful in your feedback. But by framing it just a little bit differently, it is that much easier to receive. So uh, if anyone's uh, got any questions, uh, there's Chook actually coming in. Hey, uh, hey, and my teddy hello, bear. Hello. <laughs> hello. <laughs> hi, hi. So yeah, if anyone has any questions uh, for me um, in uh, either the Discord or in uh, the chat over here on the side, I finally can point the right way, Chook. Um, oh. Yeah, over there on the side. That was in your instinct. Yay. Yeah, on the other on the other side of Chook there. Um, you put your questions in there or in the Discord, and I'm happy to um happy to answer those. Yeah, I have questions actually. Like yeah. I, I have this struggle. I think I think all, all of your advice that you gave in the talk is really good, but like I still think that a lot of times like uh, re you know code review and all this stuff is very difficult to not feel personal because you know when you really like take pride in your work you really think that it's really good uh pull request that you have sent there but like and yeah. then there's a lot of comment a lot of like asking for changes and stuff you feel you, you can you can still feel a little bit personal even if the person is trying to rephrase yeah. it you're still like oh yeah but it's not right right <laughs> yeah, so, <laughs> um yeah how, how do like maybe like on the received end like how can we kind of look at things maybe differently to make it feel better <laughs> if you if you, you have re request to change or something you know? yeah no that makes sense um one of the things I like to bear in mind is that the only reason they're giving me this information is because they think I'm smart enough to handle it. Um, and I really encourage this, like in the Python IRC room, when people come in and they say, well, hey, I've got this problem. We're like, okay, well, what are you trying to solve? Why are you going this way? Like we're having this extended dialogue with them, not because they're stupid, but because they're smart enough to engage with that conversation. Um, because honestly, when you submit a PR or if you submit a chapter to an editor or whatever for feedback, if it's actual honest to goodness dumpster fodder, no sane professional is going to take the time to provide that feedback. They're just going to, you know what? This is irredeemable. Don't quit your day job. Um, as cruel as that sounds, or they might frame that very nicely, but like the, no one, no one's going to take their time. I'm not even going to take the time to review a PR that is completely irredeemable. Like I'm just going to go, you know what? A great try, but. Um, this i don't think we can implement this as, as as written at all you know and i've actually never seen one of those personally that's that's the thing too to bear in mind like almost everything is is is, rede is redeemable in some fashion so if i'm providing that feedback or if someone's providing that feedback for me it's because hey you know what offer smart enough to take it um and so i take negative feedback as actually a compliment I think that's really good advice. I think uh, I need to remember that whenever I I see their like uh, you know comments on my PR or something. So <laughs> that's Indeed. really good. Um, I have a question. Oh, there's a question. I'll let you. I'll let you read it. Sorry. A question. Really? Okay. Yeah, in Discord. I can't find it actually. So you have better okay. host. Than I me. guess I'll read it. Yeah. Okay. So Keith asked, "How do you manage situations where, upon reviewing code, you discover there's a fundamental error?" and understanding the process, something that offers a teaching moment, but that moment takes a lot of time to work through. How do you manage to time, um, how do you manage the time needed to teach people in PRs? Um, ironically, my qualification to answer this question may also be the reason why I'm not qualified to answer this question. I run an internship. So like, this is my normal when I'm doing a PR is I will often have to do exactly this. I'll have to explain a topic. And so I just have gotten the habit over years that, you know what, sometimes I'm going to have to take 30 minutes in a PR to explain it. But um, barring that, I do like to have um, links handy, good, uh, good articles. Um, I, I like to collect these when I can. Um, so sometimes the best thing I can do is just to do a quick Google search uh, if I don't have an article handy and just 
find a good explanation because I it's, see this is the thing to understand about let, let me Google that for you is actually it's a good thing to Google things for people without hitting them with that acronym because you know what correct looks like. You know what, what because there's a lot of misleading articles online. You know what the correct thing looks like. So you can take that moment to type in the search terms that you know that the other person has not implicitly learned yet. Searching is hard. So you can do that research. It's so fast for you. You can look it up, take a skim of the article. Yep, this is correct. Here. Um, I think of the I think there's a problem here that you're aiming for X and it should be Y, I believe. Um, here's a really good article that explains this concept uh, fairly well if you need it. Um, if I'm missing something, please let me know. And again, like leaving that room to start a dialogue in case you're missing something. Um, so sometimes just providing that link um, can be very helpful. Um, and and he and he um, actually responded back because that's a really nice thing you can do. That's pretty cool. Do you walk them through the search process with them? Hint how you approach the research phase. Uh, usually, I uh, just Google search terms. So sometimes they'll say, "Yeah, um, by the way, I, I searched for this." Um, and sometimes it's okay too to actually link the page with the search results so they see your search terms. Um, that that can be okay too if most of the stuff on there is good. Uh, and you can say, "Hey, so searching is hard. Here's uh, here's what I searched for." That way, they know you're not LGB, uh, LGTMing them <laughs> 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 or uh, LGT. Let me. L M G T F. Yeah. I, I don't even I don't even know the acronym because I never use it. <laughs> yeah. Something to do with Google, I guess. <laughs> yeah, let me let me Google that for you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, by the way, uh Fett said like your YouTube streaming chair. Mine or Chooks? Because they're they're both well, hers is pretty cool. I like yours more. Your looks oh, very yeah. cozy. Mine is yeah. just like a, a chair that I can get from Amazon. <laughs> yeah, this is a wingback that I got at the used furniture store. So that's fun. Yeah, yeah okay. so uh, we have a next talk ready. We is it do. <laughs> yep, I'm just going to go to a break really fast and I'm going to okay. swing into this next talk here, uh, <laughs> which is going to be, let's see, what, what is that? Uh, security considerations and Python packaging oh, yeah. is actually coming up. Uh, so that's uh, if anyone caught my talk earlier about um, about packaging in Python, I guess this is a great sequel. I, I'm looking forward to hearing this one. And then later on, um, they're getting chaotic using Chaos Toolkit to re determine resiliency for your web app. So that should be good. And then making location based searches with Google Places API and Elasticsearch. So got some uh, got a good mix of uh, topics coming up. Uh, after these messages, of course. Go grab your teddy bears. <laughs> back on here welcome back to pajamas rolling through the night on the quiet storm and uh, i can't read with these on <laughs> now i keep trying to do this dj vibe but i can't read with the sun uh, halfway down something like that uh, so we got the coolest smoothest tech talks in the universe um, so coming up, we have security considerations in Python packaging. But before we hit that, make sure that if you're not in the Discord channel, you drop in there. 
There it goes. Uh, actually, you don't have to type that fast because you can look over there in the um, comment section and there's the link to Discord in there. Pop in, join the conversation. Um, and then uh, we also have this book giveaway going on. So uh, register to uh, maybe win a Python book from Packet. And we have lightning talks coming up later, so register for that. What's the lightning talk? Five minutes or less, you can talk about whatever, thing, whatever you want. Uh, no preparation necessary, no slides necessary, no rehearsal necessary. It's a lot of fun, actually. So, you know, there's not a lot of pressure. It's just a great, lot of fun opportunity to stand up and just, you know, talk for a few minutes about whatever you like. Uh, so let's uh, dive into this next talk here, uh, which is security considerations in Python packaging. So I'm going to get that queued up here. Enjoy. Hello, everyone. My name is Gajendra Deshpande, and today I will be presenting a talk on security consideration in Python packaging. So in my talk today, I will be speaking about importance of a secure package and vulnerabilities in Python package index, then bandit for identifying common security issues in Python code, then safety for dependency check, then SEM grep static analyzer, general uh, guidelines for secure coding practices in python finally i'll summarize my talk and we'll take up some questions so now on this slide you are seeing the tob index for uh, python so you may be knowing that tob.com is a website which actually which basically ranks programming languages based on some ratings now you can see here that on this slide, it shows the popularity of Python. So now Python occupies the first place in the ranking of uh, programming languages. Now, this is a one more uh, uh, source which shows the uh, popularity of programming languages, that is Stack Workflow Survey. So you can see here that Python is ranked third with 48.24% of the people voting for Python. But actually, if you see JavaScript and HTML, they are above Python, but still Python is on a different plane. So it's a very popular programming language. Now on GitHub stats, also you can see here that GitHub, the Python is ranked third after JavaScript and Java. Okay, so all these things make Java make Python vulnerable because of its popularity so hackers target python because of its uh, popularity now let us see uh, open source and uh, security issues related to open source now there's a general misconception about security of open source software so many believe that since the source code is available so it's vulnerable so the reason they cite is that the source code is open source. But in reality, that is not the case. Generally, the open source softwares are um, secure. So security issues are mostly due to the lack of understanding of secure coding principles. So Python is secure, but vulnerabilities may be present in packages. So this statement is true for any open source software. It may be WordPress, it may be Django, it may be Flask. So by design, these softwares are secure, but the vulnerabilities are present in packages or modules or plugins because many times these are developed by third party people who are unaware of secure coding principles. The next we'll see the importance of secure package. So insecure package will make your application vulnerable and prone to external threats. That is, they provide backdoor entry to the hackers. Okay, so your software is secure, as I have said. Your uh, software by means your content management systems like Django, WordPress, Joomla, or even Flask or Python, these are secure. But the third-party plugins make the application uh, vulnerable. So compromise and unauthorized disclosure of information may result into personal and uh, company reputation, and also it can cost money. So unsecured code may damage the systems of the users. Sometimes it may also lead to the physical damage. So it's so not only it leads to the data loss or information loss 
or reputation uh, damage so it may also lead to the physical damage of the systems now there are some articles which highlight the security issues in PyPy. So the first article speaks about the dependency confusion attack in uh, PyPy repo. So it shows the flawed package installer behavior. Then the security company called JFrog, which has detected the malicious PyPy packages, which are stealing credit card uh, information and injecting the malicious code into the applications. Then the third article by developer.com shows the repository vulnerabilities discovered in PyPy. Then the fourth article, which has written as a blog on uh, Roytuck, it shows the potential remote code execution in PyPy package index. Then supply chain flaws are also found in uh, related uh, Python packages, and it has been highlighted by eSecurity Planet. Now let us discuss some tools. Let us, the first tool we are going to discuss is the Bandit. So Bandit is a tool designed to find common security issues in uh, Python code. So to do this, Bandit processes each file, builds an abstraction syntax tree from it, and runs appropriate plugins against the abstraction syntax tree nodes. So once Bandit has finished scanning all the files, it generates a report. So you can install Bandit using a command pip3 install Bandit. Then you can run Bandit against the specific uh, code repository by specifying the path of the code repository. So for that, you need to make use of uh, minus R switch. Now, if you have a code repository written and if it is stored on your local machine, then you can specify the path of path of um, a folder or a code repository on your local machine. Otherwise, if you have hosted it on repositories like GitHub or GitLab, then you can also specify the code path here with the help of minus R switch. Then you can also run Bandit with specific profiles. Say, for example, you want to check examples. Dot, you want to check all the files, all the Python files in examples folder against the profile of shell injection. Then you can also run Bandit with standard input. So for that, you can use the cat command and you can uh, supply the output of cat command with cat command to Bandit command with the help of a pipe. The next is Bandit allows specifying the path of a baseline report to compare against the uh, baseline argument. So you can specify the baseline argument by using minus B switch and by writing baseline. Then it is very useful for ignoring the known vulnerabilities that you believe are non-issues. So you can consider them like uh, warnings. So your program runs with even there are warnings. So you can consider, for example, clear text password in a unit text, unit test. This is not an issue actually. It is not a not a vulnerability. So it's clearly a, a text password in the plain text. So in testing phase, it's fine. So you can ignore such things by using baseline uh, report. Then to generate baseline report, simply run bandit. Uh, with the output format set to JSON. So JSON stands for JavaScript object notation and only JSON formatted files are accepted as baseline. And you can also specify the path to output file where you want to store the output of this baseline report. Okay, so you need to use minus O switch here to redirect the output to a specific output file. The next writing uh, bandit tests, there is a, a procedure which you need to follow. So to write a test, first you need to identify a vulnerability to build a test for and create a new file in the examples directory that contains one or more cases of that vulnerability. Then consider the vulnerability you are testing for and mark the functions with one or more appropriate decorators. So you can use decorators such as 
add checks call and add checks import and import from then add checks string then create a new python source file to contain your test the function that you create should take a parameter context which is an instance of the context class you can query for the information about the current element being examined you can also get the raw abstract syntax tree node for more advanced use cases so in that case it is a context.py file then you can extend the bandit configuration file as needed to support your new test then execute bandit against the test file you defined in the examples directory and ensure that it detects the vulnerability so here you can consider the variations on how this vulnerability might present and extend the example file and test the function accordingly now you can see here that there are many types of tests and these uh, tests are grouped into different categories so each category is identified with an identifier so uh, the plugin groups which have the identifier uh, say b1xx they are miscellaneous texts b2xx is consists of application or framework misconfiguration uh, test then b3 access consists of blacklist with respect to calls then b4 xx consists of blacklist with respect to with respect to imports then b5 xx series consists of uh, uh, cryptography related uh, tests then b6 xx related to the injection tests and b7 access xx related to cross site scripting tests so you can see here that they are, have been specified here on this slide bandit test plugins so b11 b1 xx series you can see here that they have mentioned it as assert used executed then it will check for whether the bad file permissions have been set whether uh, all interfaces have been uh, binded hard coded whether the password has been uh, password string has been hard coded or whether function uh, password has been hard coded whether default password has been set and so on so similarly with respect to uh, b2 series it is it checks whether the debug uh, flag is set to true for flask then for b5 series b5 xx series there are some um, uh, tests related to ssl then weak cryptographic key and so on so these are mostly related to hashes uh, security aspects and cryptographic uh, keys then similarly uh, there are some uh, tests related to the processes so those processes are grouped into um, b6 uh, series The next is the safety check. So safety uh, is a package in Python which checks your installed dependencies for known security vulnerabilities. So by default, it uses the Open Python vulnerability database called a safety DB, but it can be upgraded to use pyapp.io the safety API using the key option. So it supports Python 3.5 and above. So you can install pip. You can install safety using pip command. You can also install this uh, package called as insecure package for testing purposes. Now to check your current uh, selected virtual environment for dependencies with known security vulnerabilities, you can just say safety check. Then you can also check it against the requirement uh, file. So you can um, have a set of plugins mentioned in requirements.txt file and you can check uh, for uh, dependency vulnerabilities or known security vulnerabilities for the packages mentioned in the requirements.txt file then you can also read uh, the package list from the standard input okay. then you can also use freeze command so basically it gives you the list of um, packages which are installed using pip so you can check whether uh, how many packages are vulnerable here 
then you can also specify the specific package and check whether it is vulnerable whether it has got any security vulnerabilities now this is the example here we have just run the command safety check and it shows which version is installed and which version is affected now you can see here that in earlier uh, in earlier sli sli slide insecure package was not installed so vulnerability was not shown here but now it is installed and now it shows that uh, the particular version is uh, affected next is the safety db so safety db is a database of non security vulnerabilities in uh, python packages so the data is made available to made available by pyup.io and uh, synced with the repository once per month most of the entries are found by filtering uh, cves that is the common vulnerability database and change logs for certain keywords and then manually reviewing them then the list is not a blacklist or package to be avoided so this is very very important statement so it just gives which lists are vulnerable and by how much percent if you look at the list uh, you will see that some well known uh, packages like numpy have also been mentioned but it doesn't mean that you need you need not you need you need, you need you need to avoid it okay you can use them but there are more number of vulnerabilities than of course it is uh, issue of concern but if there are one or two if there are very less and if, if the package is well maintained then you can always go ahead and use it so this gives you the indication that some things you can avoid okay so you can install safety db by pip command then this particular url that is pyup.io dot gitab dot io slash safety db it gives the list of insecure python packages so if before installing any python package you can just go to this url and check whether the package is listed here okay as i have said it doesn't mean that even if it is listed here you should avoid it no okay it gives you some indication that okay whether to use it or not to use it then for using the program you have got two json files one is insecure.json and second one is insecure full.json so insecure.json file contains just the package name and all the insecure releases as a plain text whereas insecure full.json file it additionally contains the cve description and urls and the relevant part of the change log so you can install uh, uh, the safety db by using pip command and if you want to use it in the program then you can import the safety db and import the insecure and insecure full json files then there are some safety db tools uh, such as safety ci then safety safety django safety bar pre commit pip env check and so on so first one is safety ci it is basically used for continuous integration it's a deep github integration that's available on pyup.io it checks your commits and pull requests if there are any errors if there are any vulnerabilities it will report then safety is a command line tool that checks virtual environments and requirement files either locally or run on a ci server safety django is a package for django that wants you in the admin area if your installed django release is insecure then safety bar alpha it is available as a menu bar application on macintosh os then pre commit is a hook by created by or written by lucas simon it checks your python dependencies against safety db then ppnv check relies on safety and safety db to check for non vulnerabilities in locked components the next is the semgrep which is open source static analyzer it's a open source works on 17 plus languages including python go java ruby typescript and so on it works with legacy languages it is not vendor controlled that means there have been thousands of rules which have been written by the community it enables you to write your own rules rules look similar to the code results available in the terminal editor or ci cd that is continuous integration or continuous development 
it addresses OWASP top 10 issues such as um, uh, broken authentication, uh, broken access control, injection, insecurity serialization, and so on. It eradicates classes of bugs by enforcing code guardrails at every stage of the development workflow. So code guardrails are nothing but the conditions. So it en includes conditions at the every stage of the development workflow. Then it helps you to hunt vulnerabilities by iteratively exploring a code base with lightweight queries and a REPL workflow. So REPL stands for read, evaluate, print, and loop workflow. Then lastly, we'll consider the general guidelines so if you are a package maintainer, then ensure that the package you are maintaining is secure and practice secure coding. As an application developer, follow secure coding principles while writing code. So secure coding principles are like we use query parameterization, do the input validation wherever possible, avoid a deserialization uh, from untrusted uh, sources, et cetera, et cetera. Then use tools to check vulnerabilities before using them in your projects. Then periodically scan your development environment, test environment, and also the production environment. Then sign and verify packages using PGP keys. Then use Twine for improved security and uh, testability. Scan packages before upgrading. Then ensure that you install code from the tested source, that is from the correct repository. Thank you. If there are any questions, we can take it up. Okay, so um, that was from uh, Juan Deshpanda, um, who is not here right now, but um, uh, he's probably on the Discord, so you can ask your questions over there um, if you have any uh, questions for him. So uh, coming up here, oh, we still got some awesome talks on. Uh, on the docket here. So coming up next after a brief break, we have uh, using Chaos Toolkit to determine resiliency for your web apps. We're gonna get a little bit chaotic. Uh, later on, we have uh, making location-based searches with Google Places API and Elasticsearch. Um, uh, later on, uh, how to organize original week-long open source event. So switching gears from uh, some of the technical stuff and start talking a bit about uh, uh, community. Uh, and by the way, that one's given by my friend Laura Funderburg. So definitely see that one. I might be biased. Um, so yeah, um, by the way, make sure that you are on that Discord channel. Uh, link is also over there in the uh, uh, chat for the live stream. Um, and uh, there's a link too for uh, entering to win a packet uh, book on Python. Um, and uh, for that, if you want to do that, so in the meantime, please stand by. Um, we will be right back with a bit of chaos after this very non-chaotic message from our sponsor, Microsoft. Talk to you soon. <laughs> So we've still got some awesome talks uh, queued up to go. So I uh, hope you got a fresh cup of whatever beverage makes you cozy. And uh, I got my water. 
so coming up next here, we have using Chaos Toolkit to determine resiliency for your web app. Um, I have to say I'm a little excited about this because chaos-based testing is um, kind of an interesting topic for me. Uh, so, yeah, uh, hang on to your hat for that and um, stick around because we got some cool talks coming up after that as well. So enjoy. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining this session. My name is Karan, and today I'll be talking about uh, using the Chaos Toolkit to determine the resiliency for your web app. So before I begin with the presentation, I would like to thank uh, the entire team of Pajama 2021 for giving me this opportunity to present my talk. So thank you so much. So here's a brief introduction about me. So I've been working uh, primarily as an Android mobile developer for the past five plus years now. I've also been working on cutting edge technologies like AI, AR, and VR. And I would say apart from being passionate about technology, I also love writing poems, uh, traveling to different places across the globe and meeting new people. So that's about me in a nutshell. Now they say that failure you know, is a stepping stone to success, but in the world of technology, you know, failures can actually cause expensive outages to companies. And a lot of software companies uh, you know, are using microservices and cloud-based architectures nowadays to create uh, their end solutions and products. And no longer uh, you know, are the systems, I would say, simple systems where you had either a single front end or a single back end. But nowadays systems are more heterogeneous in nature and are getting you know, complicated day by day. And to be honest, nowadays there is there is even no time for a downtime. So then the question arises, how does actually one you know, try to deal with failures, especially, you know, failures in case of production environment. So for that, we need to understand something called as chaos engineering. Now, chaos engineering, if you, you know, if you have to define it, it means, uh, you know, it, it helps to identify weaknesses in a system through certain controlled experiments, uh, you know, to introduce that introduce certain random or unpredictable behavior. Now, uh, this this phenomenon or this concept actually came, um, you know, into existence and became very much popular, especially after the Netflix uh, you know, story, which involved uh, the development of a tool called Chaos Monkey. And this tool basically would uh, was used to disable, uh, you know, randomly some production instances to identify again the failures without impacting the end user. So as developers, you know, we all want our systems or our end products to be robust, right? So, and hence there is a need for us to plan or, you know, for, to identify failure as early as possible. And one needs to identify these weaknesses uh, through controlled experiments. And for that, actually, one needs to have a kind of a toolkit. So for that, uh, you know, we have something called as the chaos Toolkit. Now, the Chaos Toolkit is uh, a simple uh, engineering toolkit made for developers. It is based on Python and it has mainly two objectives. So, one objective is to again to apply the principles of uh, Chaos Engineering. So, it provides an easy starting point for developers to apply these principles of Chaos Engineering. And on the other hand, it also provides uh, you know an open API to integrate with multiple systems. So, you know these are the primarily the two main objectives. Yes, it is open source and it can also can be extended to any uh, system as well. And the highlight of this kind of a toolkit is that it allows developers to define their experiments using standard JSON or YAML. So one need not actually you know, try to learn any particular specific you know, language for this using this toolkit. One can easily rely on you know, a JSON or a YAML, uh, his, his JSON or a YAML knowledge to basically st start creating or start writing his first chaos experiment. So how does actually one go about uh, writing your first experiment? So for that, you need to install a chaos toolkit. So chaos toolkit, by the way, uh, it officially supports Python 3.6 and above. And one can actually install it using a simple uh, pip command where you could you know, run the pip command to install the latest uh, version uh, by creating, uh, you know, you could create a virtual environment and then install that, uh, you know, in that as well. So uh, this is how easy it is to, to get started uh, or to install Chaos Toolkit. But uh, before we try to first create an experiment, it is important for us to understand an, a concept called the steady state hypothesis. Now, what exactly is the steady state? So steady state, uh, you know, if you if you had to uh, explain it to a normal uh, person, it would be it would be 
basically a normal state, a state in which your system is working perfectly fine. So a steady state hypothesis mainly involves two things. So before you run the experiment, you need to ensure that your system is in the normal state or it's working as expected. And as well as once your experiment is you know, running or once it has run successfully and finished, then two, you need to basically check whether your system is still in the steady state or in the normal state. So the steady state hypothesis basically involves uh, comparing uh, the system uh, in case of two scenarios before the running of the experiment and then after running of the experiment as well. So this is how important uh, you know this uh, you know this steady state hypothesis is. So we will understand this when we you know, write our first experiment. So let's uh, you know try to understand how an experiment looks. So this is an example, a very simple example of how a simple experiment uh, can be defined. So here you can see I have an experiment.json file which contains a title, a description, and I have uh, my steady state hypothesis block which is defined. It also contains something called as probes. Now probes are basically a way of observing a uh, set of conditions of the system which is under experimentation. So one could actually define a probe. Uh, in, in this case, I have defined a probe uh, which has a tolerance of say 200. So this is basically, tolerance basically would uh, would mean that it would expect this value, uh, you know, to, to or it, it expect the status uh, as 200, especially when I'm using a provider in this case as an HTTP provider. So the, the idea here is to basically hit the endpoint and to check if everything, you know, is up and running. So this is how uh, one could actually define his steady state. But then it all depends on uh, the requirement of the project as well, where you know the steady state hypothesis can mean different for different projects as well. In addition, you see something called as a method block. So a method block basically it represents a uh, you know the set of activities uh, that you would need to carry out as a part of the experiment, and it would contain again you could you could define certain actions and probes as a part of the method block. Actions would basically represent those activities. And uh, there's also a blob which is called as rollbacks. So rollbacks basically would, as the name suggests, would help you to roll back or uh, to revert any, any particular you know, action that you may invoke as a part of the method blob. So this is a very simple example or a very basic example of how one can actually write his first, uh, you know, uh, an experiment with a steady state hypothesis. It is important to note that the steady state hypothesis here is something which is mandatory. So you need to define a steady state hypothesis in your experiment. So that is about, um, you know, how one can write his first experiment. So coming to the next part where, how does actually run it? How does one actually run it? So to run it, you use a simple command, uh, which is basically chaos run followed by the name of your experiment file. So in this case, it is experiment or JSON. So what would happen is that, uh, you know, the chaos toolkit will of course first validate your file. It will check if everything is correct syntactically, the, you know, the file, if it file looks valid, it would then start running the experiment. And then, uh, you, you know, as you can see, it starts uh, checking for the steady state hypothesis. So this is going to run, uh, you know, as a as a first step. It will check if the website is running, and if yes, it would say that the steady state hypothesis is met. And then is where it starts, you know, starts uh, executing the methods and the various, you know, the actions that you have defined as a part of your probes uh, or your methods block. So this is how you know it runs, and once it has uh, executed that, it would again basically uh, run the steady state hypothesis, or the it will execute the steady state hypothesis to check if everything is fine as well. So this is how you know the the experiment flows. So let's try to understand this uh, using uh, you know uh, an example that I have uh, you know come up with. So let's move to the editor now. So in this case, uh, if I go back uh, to my editor, uh, in this case, I have seen an experiment, uh, the JSON file, which I have already created, uh, which basically has the same kind of um, data. So in this case, I have uh, not defined the title of the experiment, I have defined the description of the experiment, and you can see something called as a contribution. Now the contributions are basically the, the valuable system properties. So in this case, I have defined certain properties of the target system, which I want uh, you know, to, to, to check in terms of the reliability, the scalability. So here you can have certain values that you can define. So you, know, you can either have a low or a medium or a high. And if you don't want any kind of a value, you can also default it to say a none. So this is, uh, you know, this is one of uh, the additional, uh, you know, properties as well that you can define as a part of your experiment. Now coming to the steady state hypothesis, where you see that, uh, you know, I have a steady state hypothesis defined over here. I have a probe, uh, I have a probe property in which I have the probe uh, defined. 
and it has a tolerance of 200 uh, and it has a provider of http which would mean that it would try to invoke this particular url and it check if the status quo is 200 if yes it would basically uh, you know uh, it would it would mark this experiment or it would uh, understand that the experiment is, is is okay and if there is if there is a tolerance which is not uh, 200 or even like a different value it would consider the experiment to be a failure so this is, uh, you know, this is why the tolerance value is uh, is important for you to determine whether the experiment is actually uh, failing or whether the experiment has successfully executed or not. So one can actually configure this provider using multiple uh, options as well. So maybe for uh, this example, I will not deep dive much into that, but then one can actually create it, uh, you know, using based on his or her requirement as well. Coming to the next block, which talks about the method. So I mentioned the method block can contain a set of activities. So it can define a set of activities and which can be either of type probe or it can also be of type action. Now, in this case, I have basically uh, checked for uh, a response. So I have checked, I'm checking if my response, so I have a tolerance defined, uh, which is of type JSON path which means that I would, uh, you know, in the response, I'm checking for a variable called name and I'm expecting the value to be the one that I have defined as a part of the expectation. So this kind of a, this kind of a tolerance or this kind of a configuration helps me to check uh, you know, certain response parameters uh, as a part of the, you know, the response that I get from the endpoint. And then the provider basically would basically have the same kind of information, but in this case, I would point to a different, uh, say an endpoint that I would like to test as well. So this is how easy it is to, you know, to configure your, you know, certain actions and certain probes. Now coming to the, you know, part which is called as control. So I'll be talking about controls, uh, you know, in some time. So I will be discussing more on this. So coming to the next block, which is about rollbacks. So rollbacks, as the name suggests, would be basically to roll back or to, you know, undo a particular action. So here you could actually uh, do a kind of a rollback where you can check if uh, you know the if the if there is uh, an issue or something you could roll back to the to the stage to the either to the steady state or to a state which is you know similar to the state to the steady state so that is basically how one could actually define a rollback now how do we run this uh, experiment for that uh, let's see uh, this in action so for that uh, let me try to first uh, run the server so i would basically invoke the or run the server before you know, running the uh, running the experiment. So the server is up, and let's uh, try to now run the experiment over here. So to run the experiment, you will use a chaos run command. So I have used the chaos run command followed by the experiment name. So let's see this. Uh, let's try to run this. So as you can see, it will first start validating the experiment. If it's valid, it would go ahead, and then it would start, uh, you know, uh, running the steady state hypothesis. So here, as you can see that once the steady state hypothesis uh, has been determined or has been met, it will start, uh, you know, executing the methods. And in this case, in this case, I have a probe already defined, uh, which is basically to check if uh, the website or the site or the endpoint returns uh, 200 response so this is how you know one can configure uh, you know the the various uh, methods or the various actions uh, as a part of your uh, you know as a part of your experiment so this is how uh, one can go about uh, you know creating a very simple experiment so coming back to the presentation so we talked about uh, we talked about uh, the running of the experiment uh, now we need to understand how does one actually configure the chaos toolkit now, in terms of configuring the Kiosk Toolkit for a Flask-based uh, app, we need to also understand uh, the, the certain, there are certain uh, you know, steps that we need to follow. So this is kind of a checklist that I would like you know, uh, to, to recommend that if you're trying, uh, trying it out for a Flask-based app, this is kind of a, a checklist that one could follow to, to ensure or to configure Kiosk Toolkit uh, in your Flask-based app. So what could what one could do first is to define certain endpoints, and that is uh, you know the I would say the the first step. Second step involves using of a chaos middleware. So I'll be talking about uh, what exactly is a chaos middleware. The third would involve creating control extensions, which also I'll I'll be highlighting. Uh, and the last part is about automating the whole process. So of course you you need to automate the whole process for you to basically ensure that uh, there is no manual kind of an intervention so you need to define these experiments and then you know run them automatically uh, each time you know uh, a certain uh, a certain kind of uh, failures happen so this you know this uh, kind of uh, automation is uh, critical as well to the overall process 
So the first step basically is to define the endpoints. Now the endpoints is something that you would already have, or you might have already, you know, be uh, already have defined in your flask based app. So here is you could, here is where you could, uh, you know, have leverage that. So if, in this case, I have, you know, defined a couple of, I would say, uh, certain endpoints which I would like to, you know, use for. So uh, an endpoint which is returning maybe an okay response an endpoint which is returning a failure response. So this is something that you could have uh, already defined in your Flask app. And uh, you know, using this, one can uh, one needs to define this so that one can actually check uh, you know, each one of these endpoints through uh, the various uh, methods or through the various actions uh, as a part of your experiment. So once you, uh, you have defined the endpoints and once you're aware of you know, the various endpoints, you could then go on to the next step which is basically to introduce something called as a chaos middleware. Now, before we try to you know, understand what exactly the chaos middleware, let's also try to understand why do we need to use a chaos middleware. Now, especially in web applications or especially in applications that uh, use microservices, you need to have uh, something that would help you to allow or introduce certain failure conditions. And you need uh, also something that would help to verify uh, the application's resilience uh, you know, in case of a failure as well. So for that, uh, uh, the good part is that uh, there is a package that uh, you know that is that is already existing, which is called as a proved of chaos middleware plus package, which is uh, supporting Python 3.5 and above. And this package basically helps you to easily uh, introduce uh, failure conditions or introduce certain uh, concepts like delay and fault uh, faults as well, simulation of delays and faults. Through by by configuring a middleware, a chaos middleware. So all you need to do is that you need to configure certain uh, parameters like the application name, the application environment, and a token, and that is all that you need to basically uh, you know introduce this uh, kind of a chaos middleware in your Flask based app. So of course you you will also need to install this as a part of your you know as a part of your uh, the app itself. So you, you need to install this package. And once that is done, you you can actually test it out uh, by by uh, invoking one of your endpoints. So here is where you I have uh, you know tried it out using uh, a sample endpoint that I have uh, that I had defined in my Flask app, where uh, you can see that I have passed uh, you know a header basically called as a X proof doc attack, which takes a particular value. And if I basically pass that, it would help me to introduce a failure uh, in case of or I would say simulate a failure or a fault condition. So this kind of a you know approach can help you to also you know identify what would happen in case of a failure, whether the endpoint is you know responding or I would say you know behaving as you know as what you know is expected. So this is also one of the ways by which you could uh, you know simulate uh, faults and delays using the proof of proof of uh, framework and the extension that uh, is provided. So moving on to the next slide now. We talked about using chaos middleware, but again, if you want to customize something, you will need to have something called as a as a control extension. Now, controls, as the name says, they are used to control or you know change uh, you know the experiment or the or the behavior of the experiment during the execution. And what uh, it offers, what the control extension offers, is that it helps you to define a set of functions which are basically more of lifecycle methods. I would say where you can actually leverage uh, these methods to write your custom logic where like, for example, you have methods like the before activity control or the after activity control, or even like a configure control where you could write certain custom logic to, to introduce certain change or unpredictable behavior. And it, the important part is that you need to declare it as a part of the experiment. So that is where the controls block would be, you know, would be leveraged. And you could define, uh, you know, something like uh, a provider in a property called provider within the controls uh, block of the type Python, and then this uh, specify the name of your model. So we will try to understand this, uh, you know, in more detail uh, through a demo as well. So uh, after you activate the control extension, you will see that, uh, you know, there is a slight change in the output in this case. So once you run the experiment in this case, you would see that uh, once the website returns, uh, you know, a 500 error, you have you, you can also log in a particular message, or you could you know do certain custom actions saying that okay, yes, the website has returned 500, so there is something uh, you know there is something wrong, and that needs to be checked. So there is here is where you could uh, write that particular you know, message or write that particular logic to as a part of the lifecycle method of the control extension as well and uh, this will help you or uh, help the developers understand that uh, you know this this particular endpoint is not uh, as resilient as expected 
So let's see this in action uh, again uh, through the editor itself. So this is uh, so here is uh, an experiment that I have defined uh, having a control extension. So this is the control extension uh, which I have already defined. And if you can, uh, if I can show you the uh, the the extension itself, so you can see it as a part of the uh, you know the packages that I have. So I have this uh, JSON response uh, kind of uh, a simple basically. Uh, and a uh, control extension. So it has basically a control.py file, which has all the lifecycle methods defined. So you have uh, you know all the lifecycle methods defined over here. And one can uh, write his custom logic over here itself. So in this case, I have gone with a simple logic where I have checked the, you know, the output uh, of the JSON. Uh, and in case of a proof doc uh, kind of uh, an extension, one can actually also you know, use the same. So in case of proof doc, you will also see a control.py file. And once you open the control.py file, you can see that there are similar methods which you can check. So here is where you can actually uh, write your own custom logic as a part of the of, as a part of the methods to to define uh, to understand the behavior of the method and also to you know try to uh, make the developers aware like there is something wrong uh, with the with the method itself. So this is a you know simple example of how one can configure. So let's try to run this experiment uh, as well. So you know, to run this experiment, let's uh, use the same command that we used before. So, so this is this command would uh, you know I would try to run it in uh, say a verbose mode. So this will help you to understand uh, you know the different uh, steps that have been taken uh, while running the experiment. So once I run this experiment, you can see that uh, it has executed the experiment. So it has already. Uh, you know, met the steady state hypothesis has been called, and here is where the error was introduced. So, if you see the you know, the message that uh, was printed above, this was basically true to the the proof doc, uh, the attack that would that I had introduced uh, as a part of my control extension. So, once it has returned a failure, so yes, it has done, it has returned a failure, and this is where uh, you know I have uh, used the proof doc proof doc extension to introduce that uh, to purposefully introduce that failure. And once it has also, you know, reached the step where it has checked for the JSON uh, no response. In this case, it has also succeeded, saying that yes, uh, it it has a response that has returned a 200. So this is how one can actually use, uh, you know, the the chaos toolkit to to define control extensions and also to to customize those extensions for, you know, based on the project requirement as well. So uh, so this is about uh, the control extensions. Now moving back uh, again to the presentation. So coming to the last part where, uh, you know, once you have configured your extensions, it is important for you to, you know, automate now the overall process. And for this one can leverage a Docker uh, with a Python image. So you, all you need to do is you need to create a Docker file, which, you know, specifying the, the Python version, the virtual environment uh, creation, and you could copy, you know, the, the requirements.txt uh, file, uh, you know, run that, and then run the, run the, uh, the server uh, on Docker itself. So that is, you know, pretty straightforward. But the main part is uh, using something called as Jenkins, where you know this this would basically do the whole uh, I would say the whole pipeline thing, where you could actually create something called as a staged pipeline, and you can define your stages like uh, you know building that would involve building the Docker image, then running the container uh, which would in turn uh, run the server, and then finally running your experiments uh, as a part of that. So this uh, you know three steps or three stages would help ensure that uh, you know all your experiments uh, which are there are would run and uh, you know th that would basically help you to ensure how resilient the system is, uh, especially uh, as a part of your pipeline. So the output of this would you know look something like this where you, you could do a simple uh, you know check of the environment. You could then uh, you know build uh, the Docker image, run the Docker container, and then finally run the chaos exper experiments itself. So you know this is uh, you know the one one of the ways, but you could uh, you know use any kind of a CI uh, you know, framework out there to you know to automate uh, this process as well. So uh, coming to the uh, to the end of the presentation, I would say yes, system failures have uh, you know nowadays been very has become very difficult to predict, and one needs to actually be a little more proactive in terms of learning. I would say from failure, and the focus again needs to be cre on creating a more resilient environment. And to be, you know, to be more open uh, to failures and let failures actually happen early as possible. And the good thing about using the chaos toolkit is that you could actually extend it. Uh, you know, as I mentioned before, uh, you can leverage Python. Uh, you know, your own. You can create your own modules and you can uh, extend it. Uh, you know, based on your 
requirements. So with that thought in mind, I also would uh, like to mention that I have put down the, the slides and the code uh, at the link mentioned below. So please feel free to you know download that and uh, you know leverage that and maybe you know come up with uh, better, I would say, solutions as well. So uh, once again, I would like to thank uh, the entire team of uh, the Pyjamas uh, 2021 for uh, giving me this opportunity. And uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. So thank you and uh, have a nice day. All right. So um, if uh, you do have any questions, um, uh, Karen uh, Bokar, you can, uh, for Karen Bokar, you can um, put that in, uh, uh, in the uh, Discord channel, which, by the way, the link for that is um, over in the uh, comment section. Um, actually, I can also bring it up here. Obviously, I have some uh, co host uh, bumping around in here. Uh, Blue and Lady are definitely being uh they're definitely two in the scenery here so everything's better with dogs except maybe web streams but i think there's people that are enjoying it anyway so uh coming up shortly here uh in just a minute we're gonna have uh jay miller live here uh looks like he's ready to go uh he's gonna be talking about making location-based searches with google places api and elastic search so that's coming up after that um we're hearing from uh, Laura Funderburg about how to organize a regional week-long open source event. And then after that is debugging Python applications in production with Light Run by um, Shai Almong. I hope I'm getting that right. Um, anyway, so stay tuned. Uh, we will be right back after this commercial break. And uh, hopefully the dogs will settle down, but I make no promises. See you in a few minutes. a.m. UTC at Pyjamas, and you are riding with me, DJ Codemouse92, through the night on the quiet storm. I've got my co-host here who's trying to eat my chair. Um, somebody needs to give my dog a memo that she is a dog because she varies in understanding between beaver, moth. Um, I think she may actually be a fuzzodile, a rare uh, reptile, furry reptile from Mississippi. Um, she doesn't know what she is. Uh, but hey, that's okay because I love her anyway. Uh, so uh, we have uh, Jay Miller here. Um, he's going to be talking about location-based searches of Google Places API. I, I like the the sunglasses. That was that was a good look. Yeah, thank you. Thank you bow, bow tie and and jazz quiet storm type radio Smooth. thing is a it's a good combination. Smooth talks through the night. Yeah. <laughs> works <laughs> trouble is i have a matte screen so i can't see a thing when i'm wearing these. yeah that could be a problem so i just had to sit here and tilt my head it's weird to tilt my head to the side and then i can read sort of but it's just it's, it's strange sunglasses and computers don't mix yeah that that tends to be a problem from time to time but uh i mean luckily i don't think it's too bright where you are yeah. At least not inside. No, not outside either. It's it's oh. definitely way after dark here. So where I'm at, it's uh it's let's say it's eight eight o'clock, uh, going on eight PM here. Um but uh yeah, it is um it's two AM UTC. We had a question in chat about that, so thought I'd throw that out there, two AM UTC. So uh 
yeah um, i will stop chewing on your uh, on your slot there jay and i'll let you uh get into this here awesome all right well uh uh, thank you, first of all. Uh, I'm Jay Miller. I'm a developer advocate. Uh, I did a talk uh, a little bit earlier today about uh, working with ADHD and PTSD and a few other things. Uh, this one's going to be a little bit more technical, but to get everybody in the right mindset, I want you to imagine your dream vacation. I want you to think about where you would be in, oh, if I didn't click a button two times. Um, I've spoiled it now. It's dinner time. You're hungry. It actually is dinner time for me. And you're like, you know what? For me, if it's New York City, I want some old fashioned New York pizza. So I open my app and I say, I want the best pizza in town. I want, I want the five star rated pizza. And my app doesn't know where I am. So it makes the assumption, well, I'm going to give them the best pizza that can be delivered. I'm going to give them Pizza Hut or Little Caesars. Now, I don't know if anyone else has been to New York, but um, I'm pretty sure Little Caesars is not the thing that you travel for. I don't think they have a Michelin star. They're not bad, especially in a pinch, but um, I'm not doing that. Now, what could be worse is if instead of New York City, I'm on a remote island somewhere in paradise, and I'm looking for things to do, but there aren't many things to do. And you see, this is where search can have a problem. Because when we talk about search, we talk about things like relevance, and we talk about um, getting the, the most or the best possible results for us. And sometimes that means we have to filter out the greatest solution by some metric and instead look at what's near us. And, and how do we do that from a search perspective? Well, as far as the searching goes, I would highly recommend uh, Elasticsearch. Part of that is I work for Elastic, the company behind Elasticsearch. Uh, but also Elasticsearch is built off of three tenants, and that is speed, scale, and relevance. And sure, getting search results fast is important. Sure, getting a project to scale to the size um, that you need is important. But to me, the most important part there is relevance. Because sometimes I'll actually decide that I want the lesser of the objects in terms of rating if it means I can get it faster. And, and a lot of times that's important. So what we're going to be talking about here is the idea of relevance based on proximity. And the way that we're going to solve this problem is with one word, which is geocoding. So what is a geocode? Uh, simply put, a geocode is a set of graphical coordinates that correspond to a location. Every point or every landmark on this planet, including your home, including uh, the gas station down the road, has a geo point or a geo code. And this is often with a latitude and a longitude. And the closer in number that these things are, the closer they are to one another. But as you can tell, geocodes can be very, very specific or they can be very, very vague. Um, in this case, we're going to like the 10 billionth place. We're not, we don't need that. Um, in most cases, you'll see it to either the whole number to the 10th or to the 100th place. And when it comes to searching based on a geocode, using Elasticsearch, it's not that hard. Um, in fact, we actually can read it as a string. If you give us a latitude and a longitude in one string separated by a comma, uh, and if you really want to be fancy, you can even tell us to map that uh, key as a location, then Elasticsearch can handle that. Uh, it can also handle a few other things. If you want to give us two integers, if you want to give us a subtype of location.latitude, location.longitude, that works as well. Um, but for this example, we'll keep it simple and we'll use GeoPoint as a string. Now, moving into this, how would I search for this point? Well, one thing that I could do is I could create what's called a boundary search. And that get request would be the request that I send to my Elasticsearch cluster. And I say query 
And based on this geo bounding box, the top left being this number, the bottom right being this other number, and give me some information in that area. Now, this is great if you like searching for things in rectangles or squares. Um, I tend to use circles because uh, a radius is a lot easier. Instead of saying it needs to be slightly that way and slightly that way, I can say, give me everything within a 10 mile radius. And that's actually how we will recommend searching in this case, which is called a geodistance filter. Uh, very much so you ignore the actual query part itself and you just say, give me the things that you're going to give me. This might be your traditional search. This might be your search based on rating, your search based on whatever it is you're looking for. In our example, we're going to use a query. And then I want you to filter out everything that doesn't match within a specific range of this location. Now, I've talked about what a geocode is, but honestly, how, how do we get one? I'm not going to lie. I'm hoping that we're lucky and whatever data we're working with just gives us one. Um, in many cases, that'll be the point. Um, in our example, we're going to index a bunch of different uh, colleges, actually every college in the United States, according to the U.S. Department of Education. Um, we're gonna, and they've provided their location for us so that we don't have to figure it out. But what if we're a user? What if we're trying to get the location from our users? Uh, well, one thing that we can do is we can ask for their permission and we can use the, the cursed word at a Python conference, JavaScript, and use the geolocation API and say, get their current position. And now we have a latitude and longitude and we can filter based off of those things. I find this often to be useful in some ways and problematic in others. One, we may not need their exact position. Two, they may not give us their exact permission. So these could become a problem. Uh, another option is we just have them tell us where they're looking and we give results based on that. Now, the process that you decide to use uh, really just depends on what your use case is. But for us, we're going to go with that second route, which is we're going to have them tell us where they want us to look and we're going to provide results based on that query. The only problem is, is I don't know how many people know their exact latitude or longitude. Instead, they might know their location or their city or um, a landmark nearby. And there isn't an easy way to go about getting that information. There is a tool called reverse geocode lookups which means that there's a database somewhere in the world that has all of these individual points. And then it looks and says, what's that point? Oh, here's the latitude and longitude for that. And in fact, to me, the easiest one to work with that I found, there are a bunch of these different um, servers that have this data, but the best one is the one that most people tend to use all the time, which is Google and Google Maps. Now, this talk has to follow a certain time link, so I don't have enough time to go through the process of making a project, enabling the Places API, generating an API key, and making sure you have that information available to you. But that's going to be something that you have to do for this to work. The other side of that is we need to figure out what exactly we're calling in this API. And if you saw the talk title, then I kind of gave it away. We're actually not looking up a, a geocode because that would mean that we have to have the exact point that we're trying to look up and we're wanting to search. So I figured we could use the thing that would best work with search, which is searching. And in Google, that is the autocomplete feature or the places autocomplete feature. This is the same feature that when you go to Google Maps and you type, start typing in a thing and it starts showing you suggestions based on what you've started typing. 
Now, we're not going to provide that level of functionality that would involve some JavaScript and a bunch of other things. And again, this is a 20 to 25 minute talk. But what we can do is we can actually have them provide a location inside of search and we can send that completed location to our places autocomplete query. We can tell it to only give us cities and only within countries in the US if we're looking at the data set that we're, we're going to be looking at, which is schools in the United States. Next, when we get that result, what we can do is we can then take the latitude and longitude from that and we can submit our regular query. We can do that geo distance filter. We can say some other things that are important like tags and whether or not it's a, a trade school or a degree granting uh, institution. And then we can search based on that information, all of our data within Elasticsearch. So I'm gonna be jumping into a demo at this point. I think I've got 10 minutes left. So that should be enough time. And I will say a quick prayer to the demo gods and I will show you exactly what this looks like. So first let's, let's look at the example that we have. This is our little school scouter. Not to be confused with College Board because they don't pay me to give these talks. Um, but what I can do is I can look at my area of residence that is San Diego, and I can get results for San Diego. Now, this, this seems like I'm cheating, right? Because San Diego is in the name of all of these. But if we look at the very top, the first thing that it asked me was, which city did you mean? San Diego, California, or San Diego, Texas. Now, if I'm in San Diego, Texas, yeah, that's gonna be a problem. But I'm actually near a place called San Marcos, which actually has a very similar problem because there is a Lake San Marcos, California, and a San Marcos, California, and a San Marcos, Texas. And if we start looking here, we see it gets a little weird, but then we see some Texas here. So then if I click on San Marcos, Texas, I can filter out and I can say only show me the schools that fit certain descriptions. And as I continue to click through and, and navigate into the, the site, we can apply other things. Now, I've just shown you a demo. I haven't shown you what's actually happening there. So let's go ahead and take a look at the code behind the scenes. So the first thing that happens in, in our little Flask project that we have here is we go to our home screen and it has a form and we enter some data into that form and then it runs this query that says search schools. And inside search schools, we have our little Flask WTF form and we accept this query. We check to see if a city was provided. If a city was provided, then we'll just kind of hotwire this process and just go. Um, that also allows us to connect to this via an API. And then we also do the same thing for location and tags. We collect all this information and then we do some things based on what we have. If there's a city, the first thing that we'll do is we'll get cities by name, which is a function that I'll show you in just a second. And then we'll pass that in and we'll get the location from it. And then afterwards, we'll run our query here, right here. From there, we'll take those results and we'll pass them into a template that we render. Now, I will admit using the Places API can get a little unwieldy. In fact, I've actually created a data class to kind of obfuscate some of that will unwieldiness in here. So what I want to do is I'm going to run this another search really quick. Uh, I was hoping I could actually see StreamYard. Uh, if someone can type in a location, um, please let me know uh, a good location and I'll jump in and we'll search off of that. But while that's doing that, we're going to show that we have are raw, and then we have a bunch of other information here, but we have this self.location, which is the latitude and longitude. From there, we can return it into a string, and this is that get cities by name request that we had. 
And as we do that, we can see we run this Google Maps places autocomplete. We input that query, which in our case would just be the city. Then we filter it by cities in the US. And we make a list for all the results that are listed in there. So I don't have any, I don't have anyone uh, suggesting a city yet when someone wants to throw it in there. But uh, for lack of a better idea, let's just say um, Des Moines, Iowa, just for Des Moines, Iowa. Okay. This is awesome. Let's see. Awesome. So we have Des Moines, Iowa, Des Moines, Washington, Des Moines, New Mexico, Des Moines Township, Minnesota, uh, and Des Moines Township, Missouri. This is exactly one of the problems that we might run into. So obviously here we want Des Moines, Iowa. So when we click on this, I'm going to click on this. We get some results. We go back here and what we should see, we scroll up a little bit is this is the query for those locations that we got. Uh, we see Missouri, we see Minnesota, we see uh, New Mexico, and we see Washington, and then we see Iowa. I probably should have went with the last one. It would have been a, a little bit less of a scroll. From there, we have all this information. And again, I'm not in the habit of wanting to drill through a large dictionary. So I just use the data class and that way I could just do point location and call it a day. But we see this latitude and longitude here. So then if we come back down here, I've actually printed out all the queries that we're sending so that we can see them. But we see here in our search that this query is the same latitude and longitude. And I've actually stripped out the actual query just so that it makes looking at this a lot easier. Um, but we can also see that without a location, we can filter based on tags, institution name, and um, the city and state that's available, uh, which is how we get those initial results. So hopefully with this, you can see that it's actually pretty simple as long as you know Step one is to ask Google for some information based on what you've been requested. And then the next step is to filter based off of that location and provide that to your Elasticsearch instance. Now, let's go back to our, our slides here. Here we go. And... Obviously, in this process, there are a few considerations that I want us to take. Um, obviously, this is a demo. Um, you're looking at one person pinging uh, an Elasticsearch cluster that has 6,694 records, which tells you how many times I've played around with this data that I know the exact number. Um, anytime you're dealing with a query involving pinging an API that eventually you'll have to pay for, I would definitely think of scale and I would think it cost. Um, in this case, cash, <laughs> creating a cache or a, a queue of recent or popular locations, taking some basic information at the beginning, asking for that location and using that as a way to filter out a bunch of results or uh, push some results to the forefront may make your uh, budget and your development experience a little bit better. Another thing is if you're dealing with costs, we did all of this with Google Places Autocorrect API. I did that because it was just me testing. I've never gone outside of their free tier in my testing and in my demos. Uh, I think the highest my bill's ever been was $25, which is well below the, the free tier limit. Uh, for Google Places API. Also, I will mention there are plenty of other different types of ways that you can get this type of information or you can get geocodes based on a search. Um, I would suggest looking at GeoPy as a way to make that decision-making process simpler. Uh, GeoPy gives you a single interface to access all of these different resources, similar to how SQL Alchemy does, where you just need to know one structured schema instead of how each one works or how each API works. Um, and also, this is just one solution. Um, 
I went with the similar to Yelp solution because I know the similar to Yelp solution works and it's also how Yelp does it. The, the, the very similar. Um, I'm not a Yelp developer, so I don't know the full details. But there are other things that you can do to make this process even easier, which again, that's where that geo, the locations API or the ge geography API for JavaScript is a good solution. The other thing you need to do and make sure that you always do is get permission to use people's location data if you are collecting or storing any of this information. Um, not only is it just a nice thing to do, it also keeps you out of trouble with the government in terms of uh, data collection policies. So uh, especially those in Europe, especially those in California, where you want to make sure that you are staying in compliance with CCPI or GDPR, um, those things. If you're collecting data, make sure you have their permission to collect it. Make sure you have their permission to uh, store it and use it in the way that works. Also, make sure that you have permission from the API provider to use it in a way that you'd like to. Um, there are a lot of resources out there that are available. I chose Google Places Autocomplete because they had a readable API that meant that I could use it for free and know that they weren't going to come after me. If I were to make this project public, then I would have to make sure that I am following their usage terms and making sure that I'm not breaking any, not getting into any issues with rate limiting or violating their usage, their usage policy. Um, and one of the issues that I did think about in the future that I would like to recommend um, or you know remedy in my own demo is the idea of implementing machine learning and named entity recognition analysis in my queries. And the reason why I want to do that is in our demo, our very simple demo, I tested values that I know would work. Um, I have friends that I work with that are very good at breaking my demos. And we did find a few that would indeed um, show no results. And this is a good example of one. If I were to implement something like NER analysis or natural language parsing, I could provide a query and have it segment the query for possible locations, degree paths, and institution names. And this would save me a lot of time in the future. So that said, uh, thank you for uh, checking out this talk. I hope that if you're in New York anytime soon, you try pizza that is not Little Caesars. And I also hope you have a great rest of your uh, pajamas evening. Thank you, Jay. Thank you so much. Um, so, hey, if anyone's got any questions for uh, Jay Miller, um, great time to ask them. Um, you can uh, drop them over there in uh, chat um, here on the channel, or you can put them in the general uh, channel on Discord. Um, so Elasticsearch, I've heard of this for a long time, but I never really <laughs> saw it. So like, I, I think I got a pretty good idea of what it did, but just, just to solidify, could you kind of give up a, 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 a nutshell explanation of what Elasticsearch is? Sure. So Elasticsearch is a document-based data store that relies on REST APIs to, uh, to, fetch information. And the reason I I say all of that is to say that it is a data store that is focused on searching and retrieving data, not necessarily providing a dedicated data storage like a Postgres or a MySQL. Uh, you can use it for that. This demo was just running on Elasticsearch, but the data here doesn't change very often. I index the data based off of a CSV file. Everything is, is great and hunky-dory that way. Um, if you had a bunch of information coming in and out, you might want to only use and only index what you're searching. But from there, what you're able to do is you're able to take all of that data and search on it using different query types. Um, in my presentation, we did a filter-based query uh, matched with a simple query search, something very similar to what you would do on like Google, where you just start typing stuff in 
And it will just take that information and throw it against everything that it's got. And then as you begin to provide more filters, it'll then start to say, okay, let's filter out all this information and, and give them the most relevant search. Um, but one of the nice features here is that one, we're dealing with document-based storage, which means everything is readable. Um, we're dealing with REST APIs, which means that uh, it's very extensible. You can plug it into, you know, as my demo showed, you can plug it into something like Flask, something into like a Django pretty simply. And from there, you can get results in really good time. That is cool. Thank you for that uh, talk. Really appreciate it, Jay. Uh, it's always a pleasure. Um, and uh, you are obviously in the Discord channel too. So if anyone thinks of a question uh, later on, wants to ask Jay, um, you know, ping him over on the Discord. And you're on Twitter too, uh, KJ Miller, right? Yep, I'm all the places, KJ Miller. Um, so yeah, you can find me there. Yep, all the places. Uh, now I don't want that meme. All of the places. All, all, all of the all of the places except for ones that are owned by Meta, I believe. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, so you can Same. catch me on Same. Link, LinkedIn, Twitter. That's kind of it these days. Yeah. Um, net dot app or app dot net. You know, if that was still around. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there you go. Awesome. Thank you again, Jay. That was fantastic. Absolutely. Right. Oh, so uh, we still got some uh, good stuff coming up. Uh, we have uh, coming up next. We have how to organize a regional week long open source event um, by uh, Laura Funderburk, a friend of mine. So check that out. And then uh, later on, wrapping up the block, we have debug Python applications in production with Light Run. Um, so that'll be coming up. Make sure you drop into our Discord channel if you haven't already. Um, there's a uh, can have some great conversations over there. The link for that is in the stream chat, by the way, if you're not a fast typer. Um, or it's also down there in the ticker. Uh, you can also enter, uh, there's a link there to enter to win a Python book from Packet and uh, an opportunity to uh, give some lightning talks later on. So uh, lightning talks, less than five minutes. You can talk about whatever you want. No preparation, slide deck, or anything necessary. You can bring one if you want. Um, those can be a lot of fun. Great introduction to, uh, to talking to. So, um, all right. So, uh, we're going to go, uh, take a quick break and then I'm going to be handing over the, uh, reins to, uh, another cool cat to take over the, uh, quiet storm here. Jacob is in the house. So I'll be handing off the reins to him. So I hope you all have a fantastic evening and, uh, Jacob will take care of you from here forward. See Thank you, Jason. So we'll all see right. you all after the break. So um, I'll just give a quick, sorry, I, I think I can give a quick overview on the next event because we're just two minutes short. So okay. fun fact, Laura actually worked as a volunteer last year in pajamas. Awesome. All right, so uh, a little bit about the event she's going to talk about or the talk she's going to talk about. Talk she's going to talk about, well, a bit of a mouthful. Are you curious about what it takes to organize, coordinate, and a successful Python event beyond a casual meetup? In this talk, Laura will share what she's uh, organized and coordinated in the previous PyCon events she's done or Python events she's done. In, in fact, Laura actually works as a data scientist in Siberia and, uh, Siberia, and she has a BSc in mathematics from the Simon Fraser University. Uh, so because we're running out of time, I will I will quickly put up Laura's video. Unfortunately, it's not live, but she is a part of Pyjama's Discord. So if you guys do have any questions, feel free to ask her on there or uh, the private chat if in case she's here. All right, so I'm just gonna bring up her video. Hello, everyone at Pajamas 2021. My name is Laura gutierrez Underburg, and today I will be talking to you about how to organize a week-long open source event. A little bit about me. I work as a data scientist in the non-for-profit sector, and my experience and what I'll be sharing with you comes from having organized uh, a regional event 
for Vancouver, Canada, named the Vancouver Data Gem. And most of my experience comes from acting uh, the first year as a sponsorship man manager and the second year as a chair. Uh, what I'll share with you is, of course, not an extensive list, but I hope that I, what I do share with you will help some of those of you who are getting started with uh, organizing events beyond a meetup. So let me go ahead and get started. I will go ahead and do a screen share. Oh, da, 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 da. All right, let's get started. So today's talk at a glance, I'm going to be chatting about some good reasons for organizing an event. Uh, if I persuade you that organizing an event is a worthy endeavor, I'll walk you through what, what some of the first steps you can take are, uh, how to find or how to recruit a team, uh, setting up a plan and timelines, finding community partnerships, requesting funding for your event, and making space for self-care. So why organize an open source week-long event? Well, to start, it is one of the many ways of contributing to open source. It can also help people who are getting started know the community. Um, it can help organizers gain valuable leadership experience as well as networking experience. This is one of the ways in which you can get to know a lot of people who are organizing um, seeking funding for not only events, but also for open source projects. It facilitates meeting people who share interest in open source. And it can also increase visibility of open source packages, team contributors or users. Now, assuming you are thinking of organizing an open source regional event, what's your first step? I will first, I would recommend that you determine your experience organizing, whether you have experience coordinating workshops or organizing meetups or doing any other type of organizational work. Uh, typically, starting small is a good first step before taking on something as big as a, a week long event. Uh, this will help you learn more your style when you organize. Uh, the next step is to identify someone in your network who has an interest in organizing. And then from there, I would suggest to approach them, introduce yourself and your idea. You can share, hey, I noticed that you organized a conference and I would be very interested in doing something similar. I'm wondering if you'd like to work with me. And of course, be open to learn about them, their style and their idea. Uh, be open to accept that they may not be open to organizing at this time, uh, but they may provide you a connection to someone else who might. If they have any initiatives that they support, see if there's any way you can help or even incorporate your effort to that initiative as opposed to starting a bunch of different things from scratch. Now, I do want to chat about learning how to communicate your work style. Uh, some of these might include a sporadic intense bursts uh, that are followed by periods of rest or focus on other areas of life. Other work styles might include highly organized with a need for structure and regular communication. Uh, people's avail availability might be different depending on what's going on in their full-time work or in their personal lives. And people also have different preferences when it comes to taking uh, either big or small responsibilities. So it is important that you ask yourself each and every, uh, ask yourself what type of style you have and what your availability is for organizing. Uh, so assuming you have thought about your work style, and you have found at least one person with compatible work style interested in organizing, uh, the next step is to start discussing your event theme, uh, your format, and possible roles. Some of these roles might include an event chair and co-chairs, uh, logistics, uh, web development. Uh, logistics is going to involve anything from setting up or coordinating efforts in a local venue if you're seeking to do it in person, or anything involving registration, online platforms and everything going smoothly provided is an online experience. Web development is a person in charge of getting a, a website up and running. Uh, the website is a place to advertise and take registrations from people who are interested. Uh, social media to spread the word about the event, sponsorship and finance uh, to raise funds for any expenses incurred during organizing or during event delivery and also budgeting. Sprints or projects, if your event has them. Uh, this is if you're looking to give participants more of a hands-on experience. 
and workshop coordination and proposal review. Okay. Uh, assigning responsibilities. So first, the first uh, task is if the organization that you're helping volunteer or organize with doesn't have specific roles or, or well-defined responsibilities, uh, the first thing is design or determine what those responsibilities are before assigning the roles. Once you have defined a clear set of expectations for each of the roles, assign the roles according to experience, interest, and availability. If your team is missing team members, recruit by sharing on social media. And I learned the hard way, do not let one role or crucial task fall on a single person. Uh, a lot of organized, organized work is on a volunteer basis. So if a, if a volunteer cannot take on their task anymore, if something happens and you don't want to be in the position where you're scrambling to fill in that role. So always have at least two or three people working on the same task, particularly the really crucial ones. Um, of course, it's not all about work. It's very important to make time for team bonding. And things that can help are facilitating regular check-ins. Uh, they can start once a month and then they can increase in frequency as the event approaches. It's a good idea to find a good balance between uh, frequency of meetings. We obviously don't wanna have meetings every day because that'll burn people out quite quickly, but about a month or a month and a half before the event, you'll wanna start having check-ins about once, once a week or twice a week uh, to make sure that every, everyone is on the same page. Typically, the chairs communicate to the team the tone of the event organization, but having said that, every team member is responsible also for how they conduct themselves while they volunteer. And it's all not it's not all work and seriousness. It's also important to make time for bonding. And this can mean go out for dinners or have a fun call or learn about things going on in a team member's life. And maybe they're struggling through something and maybe you are, too. It's important for both both team members to feel comfortable saying, hey, you know what, I'm actually struggling quite a lot. I could use a little breather. Having said this, uh, when we are working with a number of people and particularly when organizing something of larger scale, like a, a regional event or a week long re regional event, disagreements can come up. Uh, typically, this means this happens because people have a lot more on their plate. It's more stressful. Sometimes the stakes are higher. And so a, a natural, sometimes one way this can manifest is through disagreement. Uh, so first and foremost, assess sources of disagreement between members. This can be differences in work style or work uh, communication style. And uh, one thing that I'd recommend is, uh, regardless of whether there's conflict or not, as I encourage all communication to happen in shared channels as opposed to direct messages. This can minimize the risk of two team members uh, engaging in a fight. And also it can minimize team members feeling alienated from others if two or three team members decide to have their own uh, direct messages without incorporating others. Um, things that can help are to be proactive about conflict as opposed to letting it waiting until it, it is too late and you have to solve it. Uh, so one of those pr proactive measures can be setting up dedicated time on a regular basis to talk constructively about what is working, what could improve it, how it can be done better. This helps you identify and it helps the team identify early on if there's issues that need to be addressed prior to someone feeling like they are bursting with stress. Uh, if possible, set time aside to talk in person or video call when addressing the conflict. And if the team cannot solve the conflict on their own, uh, the team can choose an organization who is willing to talk to them and provide advice on how to solve their conflict situation. All right, let's move on to how do we set up a plan and a timeline. So as a team, uh, it's important that your team chooses what you'd like to see in the event. Uh, you might have a combination of keynote sessions, workshops, talks, sprints, data science or other projects, and networking. Um, give yourself between one year and six months to plan for your event. Uh, this will make sure it, it'll give you an opportunity to brainstorm and put together an event that you have the chance to organize with plenty of time and also when you are coordinating with stakeholders uh, sponsors and community partners typically it's a really good idea that you reach out to them with a lot of time in advance because there'll be some back and forth and emails and following up and some of those things can take some time uh, so the first month can be dedicated to researching similar events to yours and picking a date and you can decide a format and a theme the first month can also be used to develop a website, social media pages, and banners. 
And once you have these, you can start advertising on social media, whether it's to recruit for volunteers or to recruit speakers, and lastly, to recruit participants. If you are going to share your, your, your event with mailing lists, make sure that you seek consent from the mailing list uh, owner. So what, what can a week long schedule look like? So one possible scenario is that you start off with an opening ceremony. Uh, you can have a morning workshop block. So that might be more than one workshop running in the morning, a break, and then another block of workshops. You might have the same thing on the next day if you want to have if you have plenty of workshops to go around and then uh, the next two or three days you can have things like keynotes followed by talks well, the difference between a workshop and a talk is that the workshop typically is longer in duration and requires exercise and hands on components versus the talk is more to cover a new theme without necessarily needing to go into hands-on or expecting the participants to go into hands-on mode you can have birds of feather sessions and this is a great opportunity for people who who are seeking similar topics to get together and brainstorm they can also be fairly informal and sometimes self-organized during the conference you can have lightning talks which again gives people uh, an opportunity to practice their public speaking skills in a very friendly environment you can have a poster session and a social and then the last couple of days can be used for spread work whether it's people working on an open source package or learning how to contribute to open source these are all good things that you can do um, another format you can take a look at uh, if you were to design an event that has a project component in place is you can still start off with a few workshops you might give participants a chance to mingle either through a birds of feather session or some kind of networking component to to break the ice a little bit you can introduce projects you can have an exercise to let teams form and then for something like two to three days they work together on their project uh, a good idea typically is to provide some milestones for the teams like by the end of the first day you should have a prototype idea next day think about how you're packaging and document your project and then the last day is all about demos usually adding things like opening and closing ceremony provides uh, you and, as an event organizer an opportunity to uh, provide the key takeaway messages for your event and the, the sort of things that you'd like people to to leave from with from, from your event now because organizing these kinds of events requires a lot of work and coordination one thing that i've learned uh, is to establish community partnerships. Um, so typically this involves learning about groups who support people who attend your event and reaching out to them and offering to collaborate. Uh, so typically what I would do is I would I would find someone who is who is running similar events to mine and I'd say, hey, I noticed that you're supporting a very similar group to mine. I'm wondering if you'd like to collaborate. Uh, we have quite a, a team going on and we have a lot of extra support. So I'm wondering if there's something that you need help with. And they might say things like, yeah, you know, we could use some help spreading the word for our events, or we could use we could use a hand with, with an extra volunteer, or, you know, we could use some exposure. And uh, you, you can see what you can offer to them. And similarly, you can share with them how they can help you. It might be something along the, the same lines. You might even decide that you want to collaborate on the same event together and thank them for their support. Uh, thank them on your website by adding their logo and thank them on social media, add their handles, give them a shout out, uh, appreciate that all the little things matter to making your event a great one. Now comes one of the trickiest parts, which is how do you request funding for your event? Uh, the first thing is to decide whether to operate with a small or large budget. If you're not incorporated, uh, typically my advice would be to, to try to start small uh, because many organizations will require things like a GST number or a tax number or your registered organization number. And so getting large quantities of funding when you're not, you're not incorporated can get a little tricky. Um, I would say, depending if you're starting from scratch and you, you know, if, you, if you're not incorporated and you're, you're, you're coming at this for the very first time, I'd suggest, depending on the number of people you have on your team and the, their level of experience, to give yourself anywhere from one to four months of prep work. Um, for in-person events, and this is probably one of the first things that you want to tackle, don't leave this at the end. It's one of the first things you do in addition to deciding the theme of your event. This is a piece where you brainstorm whether you're, you're doing things in person or online. 
as you make this decision, investigate the prices of venues, catering and drinks, travel and accommodations, have a little bit of extra wiggle room in case something goes wrong, uh, investigate plans for online platforms, develop a budget for a dream event, uh, but at the same time, assess the event's minimum cost of operation and develop a plan for the scenario. What's the minimum amount of money that you, you can go on for uh, that would allow you to, to give it or deliver an event that you'd be happy with? And by you, I mean your team. Uh, from here, things that are super helpful are setting up a bank account dedicated for your event. You don't want any of the, any, any of the financing to fall on a team member. Seek financial advice to set up invoices and, if possible, incorporate as a non for profit. This piece uh, on itself can be quite tricky, and there might be some fees involved in registering. So, it is important to discuss with your team whether this is a good fit for your organization or not. Uh, set up a sponsor package. This is a document that, with the perks an organization gets for supporting your event, things they might get include a keynote, uh, they might get a table they might get a workshop they might get um some swag they can you can distribute their swag or any pamphlets they have to to the participants other things that you can offer include adding their logos to the website doing a social media shout out uh providing any support on any projects that they're developing and so on and so now you might be wondering okay so i know more or less how much money we want to spend and we have all of our documentation ready to go how do i ask and so the first thing is to identify organizations companies and academic institutions that support causes like yours ideally you're aiming for a combination of all of those identify someone you can talk to and ideally identify someone in your team who has a connection with that company if you don't know anyone in the company or the organization, then look for opportunities if, uh, to be introduced. This might come in the form of going to another event who happens to be sponsored by someone you're interested in. And you might say, hey, like I noticed that your organization provided funding for this event. We're running a similar event, I don't know, a year from now, six months from now. And I was wondering if you'd like to talk to me about any sponsorship opportunities, what we can offer to you to make a good deal. Um, uh, you, you can start informally by bringing up your event and asking if they think it is a good fit for their organization. Uh, provide things like the date of the event, a small summary of the event, and your website. Assess the response and provide promptly information that they request. If they say no, part of the bat, um, usually it's a good idea not to be too, too pushy. If, if you're noticing that there is some openness to collaborate, try to explore uh, what what might help in terms of them getting information from you, uh, what might help in terms of you establishing a relationship. Maybe they're looking for demographic information, they're looking for opportunities to network, they're looking for recruiting opportunities. So also before you ask, learn what the company or the organization is interested in. At the end of the day, we are establishing a relationship and a collaborative one. So we as organizers, it's important to understand the needs of those organizations that we reach out to. If it goes well, they may ask you to make a formal request. Sometimes this may involve writing an email. Sometimes it involves filling out a form. By the time you make this formal request, or even by the time you're making these informal requests, you need to have handy your budget, your event description, the names and the roles of the organizers in a clear scope of project handy. Learn the terms and conditions of the funding and learn if there's a deadline to submit your proposal. Ensure that you craft and review multiple times before you submit and do not submit late. Now you submitted, it's off of your chest, that wonderful feeling of having put together all this work and it's out there. So what do you do next? Uh, typically give the sponsor a few days to a couple of weeks to get back to you. If you don't hear back after a week or two, you can say, hey, like I'm just, um, I'm ready to check in on our proposal, wondering how things are moving along. Mm -hmm. Uh, if they provide, if they request any additional information, provide it. If the funding is approved, ensure to thank the sponsor after they provide you the letter of confirmation on social media, on the event website, during the event opening and closing ceremonies. And also, if the event, in the event that the funding is not approved, thank them for their time and attention. Just because things didn't work out this time doesn't mean that there won't be an opportunity to collaborate next in the next time round. Now, 
provided your funding is approved, what do you do next? First off, celebrate with your team. Uh, ensure that you provide an invoice to the sponsor, along with any banking information. If you're incorporated, provide a tax number and registration number. If you're not incorporated, it's important to know that it may be possible for the sponsor not to be able to give you funding or for more additional steps to be made. Uh, your team may need to find a way to find alternatives for the sponsor to support the event. It's usually a good idea to be upfront about this kind of thing early on so that the sponsor is not in a weird situation of being like, oh, I thought you were incorporated and we approved the funding. Now it turns out we can give it to you. So do try to be clear about this mm -hmm. as early as possible. Uh, ensure to track and document your approved funding, decide what part of the funding, uh, what part of the event will, it will cover and make sure that you keep receipts for anything that you do spend on. Uh, another thing that might come up after the event is done is the completion of demographic reports, scientific achievement reports, and also some sponsors will want to see a consolidation of your expenses and income reports. I know when these reports are due, sometimes it's about a month after the event ends, but the dates may vary. And uh, shut up, sorry, set up a shared cloud service to keep handy things like the registration numbers, demographic information, any talks or workshops information, biographies, etc. Now, I do want to talk a little bit about self-care. Uh, so the first thing is because a lot of organizer work does happen on a volunteer basis, it is very, very important that we as volunteers make time to take care of our health. One of those things or one of those tangible things include communicating with your team, any accommodations that can help with any physical or mental conditions. You do not need to go into details about what the conditions say. You might just say, hey, like it helps me if we don't have meetings after 7 p.m. because uh, I'm very exhausted and I need time after, or it would help me if we don't schedule meetings on a Sunday morning or on a Sunday afternoon. Um, also knowing yourself and, and try to gauge your own limits and when you're starting to feel overwhelmed is, is a good, good idea. Uh, with this is learning how to say no gracefully uh, when you cannot take on a task or we, when you cannot complete a task and you need to delegate, it's important that you communicate clearly, hey, I can't do this or I cannot do this anymore. I need I need help. Learn to receive the no gracefully as well. Uh, when somebody tells us, hey, like I have a boundary around the way this work was requested, it's important that us as organizers also learn to, to receive those no's and say, oh, thank you so much for taking care of yourself or thank you so much for letting me know. Uh, we can find someone to to work with you to help you no problem and lastly ensure that you make time to enjoy your favorite activities uh, this goes a long way in keeping your life uh, in in balance and in shape and allow you to derive meaning from volunteer work as opposed to it becoming something that uh, burns you so this is it i, I hope this was a helpful uh, chat for you and uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of pajamas. Thank you so much for having me today. Welcome back. So in a couple of minutes, in fact, exactly seven minutes, we're going to have our next talk by another co-Pythonista.
debugging Python applications in production with Lightroom. Uh, a little bit about his talk is, uh, as per the description, uh, Shai talks about having produ production issues with PL P1 alarm rings throughout the office. In fact, he talks about how he crosses his fingers, hopes someone, lo off, uh, someone logged in and does something to save the day. Uh, the premise of this talk is he, his idea behind debugging Python quickly or Python production apps as quickly is he wants to find a trusty debugger to find the root cause before going through multiple CI CD cycles and pushing logs everywhere. So in just a couple of minutes, I'm going to present a recorded talk from a code Pythonista. Take care and keep on, keep staying in your pajamas because we're going to be back very soon.
Hi everyone, I'm ready for my pyjamas talk. I have my hot cup of tea right here and I'll try to talk more slowly than my usual over-energized self. That's a nice change of pace. Today we're going to talk about debugging Python applications in production using Latran and a bit about APMs. But first a few things about me. I was a consultant for over a decade. I worked at Sun, founded a couple of companies, wrote a couple of books, I wrote a lot of open source code, and currently work as a developer advocate for Lightroom. My email and Twitter accounts are listed right here, so feel free to write to me. I have a blog that talks about debugging and production issues at talktotheduck.dev. It would be great if you check it out and let me know what you think. I love APMs. They are absolutely wonderful. I'm old enough to remember a time where they weren't around and I'm just so happy we moved past, past that. This is absolutely amazing. The dashboard and the details, you get this great dashboard with just everything you need. Amazing. We're truly at a golden age of monitoring. Hell, when I started, we used to monitor a server by kicking it and listening to see if the hard drive was spinning properly. Today with Kubernetes and the deployment scale is at such a level that we need tools like this just to get some insights into our production. Without an APM, we'll, we're, well, we're not as blind as a bat, but it's probably close. A lot of the issues we run into start when we notice an anomaly in the dashboard. We see a spike or a failure or something that performs a bit too slow. The APM is amazing in showing those hiccups, but this is where it stops. It can tell us that a web service performed badly or failed. It can't tell us why. It can't point at a line of code. So I want to stop for a second and talk about a different line. This line. On one side, we have the developers. On the other, we have the ops or DevOps. This is a line we've had for a long time. It's something we drew out of necessity because when developers were given access to production, well, I don't want to be too dramatic, but when developers got access to production, it didn't end well. This was literally the situation not too long ago. We had sysadmins, but the whole process used to be a mess. That was no good. We need a better solution than this hard separation because the ops guys don't necessarily know how to solve the problems made by the developers. They know how to solve ops problems. So when a server has a problem and the DevOps don't know how to fix it, well, it starts a problematic feedback loop of test, redeploy, rinse, repeat. That isn't ideal. Monitoring tools are like the bat signal. They come up and we, the developers, we're Batman or Batwoman or bat person or bat tea drinker. All of us damn heroes in these cases. We step up to deal with uh, the bugs and we're the last line of defense against their, well, villainy. Well, we're coder bat people. It's kind of the same thing without the six-pack abs, uh, you know, too much baked goods in the company kitchen here. Code of Batman needs to know where the crime or bugs are happening in the code. So these dashboards, they point us toward the crime we have to fight in our system. But here is where things get hard. We start digging into logs, trying to find the problem. The dashboard sent us into a general direction like a performance problem or high error rates. But now we need to jump into logs and hope that we can find something there that will somehow explain the problem we're seeing. That's like going from that jet engine back to Stone Age tools. There are many log processing platforms that do an amazing job at processing these logs and finding the gold within them. But even then, it's a needle in a haystack. That's the good outcome, when where log is already there waiting for us. But obviously, 
we can't have logging all over the place. Our billing will just go through the roof and our performance will... Well, we're stuck in this loop. Add a new log. This can take hours. Then we produce the issue in the production server with your fingers crossed and try to analyze what went on. Hopefully you found the issue because of the whole process. In the meantime, you still have a bug and there just has to be a better way. It's 2021 and logs are the way we solve bugs in this day and age. Don't get me wrong, I love logs and today's logs are totally different from what we had even 10 years ago. But you need to know about your problems in advance. No problem is I'm not clairvoyant. I might have the tea, but I can drink the tea leaves. When I write code, I can't tell what bugs problem code have before the code is written. I'm in the same boat as you are. The bug doesn't exist yet. So I'm faced with the dilemma of whether to log something. This is a bit like the dilemma of writing comments. Does it make the code so sorry about that. Uh, actually, it seems that uh, Jacob have some uh, technical issues with playing the uh, video. So uh, to be fair for our speaker, because it's a, a very good talk that the speaker provides. So uh, I would try to play from my computer. So hopefully my internet is a little bit more stable because we are in the middle of the night here in London. So hopefully nobody's awake and, uh, and using their computers. I will play again the talk. So we'll start again. Sorry about that. Uh, let's go. Hi everyone, I'm ready for my pyjamas talk. I have my hot cup of tea right here and I'll try to talk more slowly than my usual over-energized self. That's a nice change of pace. Today we're going to talk about debugging Python applications in production using Lightroom and a bit about APMs. But first a few things about me. I was a consultant for over a decade. I worked at Sun, founded a couple of companies, wrote a couple of books, I wrote a lot of open source code, and currently work as a developer advocate for Lightroom. My email and Twitter accounts are listed right here, so feel free to write to me. I have a blog that talks about debugging and production issues at talktotheduck.dev. It would be great if you check it out and let me know what you think. I love APMs. They are absolutely wonderful. I'm old enough to remember a time where they weren't around and I'm just so happy we moved past, past that. This is absolutely amazing. The dashboard and the details, you get this great dashboard with just everything you need. Amazing. We're truly at a golden age of monitoring. Hell, when I started, we used to monitor a server by kicking it and listening to see if the hard drive was spinning properly. Today with Kubernetes and the deployment scale is at such a level that we need tools like this just to get some insights into our production. Without an APM, we'll, we're, well, we're not as blind as a bat, but it's probably close. A lot of the issues we run into start when we notice an anomaly in the dashboard. We see a spike or a failure or something that performs a bit too slow. The APM is amazing in showing those hiccups, but this is where it stops. It can tell us that a web service performed badly or failed. It can't tell us why. It can't point at a line of code. So I want to stop for a second and talk about a different line. This line. On one side, we have the developers. On the other, we have the ops or DevOps. This is a line we've had for a long time. It's something we drew out of necessity because when developers were given access to production, well, I don't want to be too dramatic, but when developers got access to production, it didn't end well. This was literally the situation not too long ago. We had sysadmins, but the whole process used to be a mess. 
that was no good. We need a better solution than this hard separation because the ops guys don't necessarily know how to solve the problems made by the developers. They know how to solve ops problems. So when a server has a problem and the DevOps don't know how to fix it, well, it's not a problematic feedback loop of test, redeploy, rinse, repeat. That isn't ideal. Monitoring tools are like the bat signal. They come up and we, the developers, we're Batman or Batwoman or bat person or bat tea drinker. All of us damn heroes in these cases. We step up to deal with uh, the bugs and we're the last line of defense against their, well, villainy. Well, we're coder bat people. It's kind of the same thing without the six-pack abs, uh, you know, too much baked goods in the company kitchen here. Coda Batman needs to know where the crime or bugs are happening in the code. So these dashboards, they point us toward the crime we have to fight in our system. But here's where things get hard. We start digging into logs, trying to find the problem. The dashboard sent us into a general direction like a performance problem or high error rates. But now we need to jump into logs and hope that we can find something there that will somehow explain the problem we're seeing. That's like going from that jet engine back to Stone Age tools. There are many log processing platforms that do an amazing job at processing these logs and finding the gold within them. But even then, it's a needle in a haystack. That's the good outcome, when, where log is already there waiting for us. But obviously, we can't have logging all over the place. Our billing will just go through the roof and our performance will, well, it will suffer. We're stuck in this loop. Add a new log, go through CI/CD, which includes the QA cycles and everything. This can take hours. Then we produce the issue in the production server with your fingers crossed and try to analyze what went on. Hopefully you found the issue because if not, it's effectively rinse, repeat for the whole process. In the meantime, you still have a bug in production and developers are wasting their time. There just has to be a better way. It's 2021 and logs are the way we solve bugs in this day and age. Don't get me wrong, I love logs, and today's logs are totally different from what we had even 10 years ago. But you need to know about your problems in advance for a log to work. The problem is I'm not clairvoyant. I might have the tea, but I can't drink the tea leaves. When I write code, I can't tell what bugs or problems the code will have before the code is written. I'm in the same boat as you are. The bug doesn't exist yet. So I'm faced with the dilemma of whether to log something. This is a bit like the dilemma of writing comments. Does it make the code look noisy and stupid? Or will I find this used for 2 a.m. when everything isn't working and I want to rip the few strands of hair I still have left because of this uh, damn production problem? Debuggers are amazing. They let us set breakpoints, see call stacks, inspect variables, and more. If only we could do the same for production systems. But debuggers weren't designed for this. They're very insecure when debugging remotely. They can block your server while sending debug commands remotely. A small mistake such as an expensive condition can literally destroy your server. I might be repeating an urban legend here, but 20 or so years ago, I heard a story about a guy who was debugging a rail system located on a cliff. He stopped at a breakpoint during debugging and a multi-million dollar hardware fell into the sea because it didn't receive the stop command. Again, I don't know if it's a true story, but it's plausible. Debuggers weren't really designed for these situations. Worse, debuggers are limited to one server. If you have a cluster with multiple machines, the problem can manifest on one machine always, or it might manifest on a random machine. We can't rely on pure luck. 
If I have multiple servers with multiple languages, platforms, crossing from one to another with a debugger, well, it's possible in theory, but I can't even imagine it in reality. Let's take the Batman metaphor all the way. We need a team up. We need some help on the servers, especially in a clustered polyglot environment where the issue can appear on one machine at one point and in another later. Or worse, with tools like Airflow, bugs get distributed all over the place. And we'll get to that. So, you remember this slide. We need some way to get through that line. Not to move it. We like that line. That's a great line. We need a way to connect uh, with uh, the server and debug it. Now, I'm a developer, so I try to stay away from management buzzwords, but the word for this is shift left. It essentially means we're letting developers and QA uh, get back some of the access we used to have into the ops without demolishing the gains we had in security and stability. We love the ops people and we need them, so this is about helping them keep everything running smoothly in the servers without stepping on their toes or blowing up their deployment. This leads us here. What if you could connect your server to a debugger agent that would make sure you don't overload the server and don't make mistakes like setting a breakpoint or something like that? That's what Lightrun does. So, how does Lightrun work? Well, we install the Lightrun plugin in our ID and, let it, uh, and it lets us interact with the Lightrun server. We can insert an action which can be a, a log or a snapshot or measurement metric. I'll show all of these soon enough. This talk will go into the code portions really soon. Notice that the Lightrun server can be installed in the cloud or as a SaaS on-premise and managed by ops. The management server sends everything to the Lightrun agent, which is installed on your servers. That means there's clear separation between the developer and production. DevOps still has that guarding line we're talking about. And we don't have direct access to production. That means no danger to the running production servers from a careless developer like, well, myself. The Lightrun agent it's just a small runtime you add to your application. It's very low overhead and it implements the debugging logic. Finally, everything is piped through the server back to your IDE directly. So as a developer, you can keep working in the IDE without leaving your comfort zone. I'm going to show two demos that highlight what we can do. The first is a simple Hello World Flask server. So this is a simple Hello World Flask app which is running in PyCharm. I'll demonstrate VS Code soon enough. First, I right-click and select the log option in the menu. A log lets me inject a new log into the code at runtime without restarting the server, but there's more. See here, I can log any expression or variable from the currently running app. In this case, I'm logging the value of name logs can appear in the console below or they can appear with the rest of the logs from the code. Let's press the OK button, which inserts the new log. We can now see the dynamic log appearing just above the line as if it was a line we added into the code, but it isn't. Now let's go to the web browser window and hit refresh then go back to the IDE. And within a matter of seconds, we can see the log. Notice you can send the log to the IDE or to be integrated with the other logs from your app. Let's delete the log and select a snapshot instead. A snapshot is kind of like a breakpoint uh, you have in a regular debugger. But it has one major difference it doesn't break. It doesn't stop the threads when it's hit. It grabs the stack information, variable values, etc. But it doesn't stop the thread. So a user in production isn't stuck because you're debugging. 
Let's go back to the web UI and hit the refresh button to see the snapshot in action. Then we go back to the ID and wait for the snapshot result to arrive. Below you can see the results of the snapshot, as is the convention in JetBrains ID. You can walk the stack like you can with any breakpoint, inspect variable values like you could with any debugger, and all of that doesn't bother any live user in the system. I skipped a lot of interesting features here, such as the ability to define conditional logs or snapshots, which lets you do things like define a snapshot that's only hit when a specific user is in the system. That means that if a user somewhere has a bug, you can literally get information that's specific only to that user and no one else. That, that's pretty cool. Airflow lets you break down huge tasks, like classifying a large set of images into distributed workers that can run on multiple machines and use available resources intelligently. This makes it nearly impossible to debug a worker, uh, a worker might run anywhere, and you have all you have is a log after the fact, which you would need to dig through uh, to check for a bug or to see if a fix actually succeeded. That's a nightmare, and when I talk to Airflow developers and ask them. How do you deal with that? They literally let bugs go through. They literally accept a certain amount of bugs as the cost of doing business with Airflow because it's so hard to truly track all the bugs within a system. That's not ideal. This time, I'll use VS Code to demonstrate this functionality. This is a simple Airflow demo that classifies images. The problem with Airflow is that we don't have an agent or a server on which our code is running. An agent can come up uh, pro, uh, with a process and then go away. By the time we set the snapshot into place, it will be gone, completely finished executing. This is where tags come in. Tags let us apply an action, such as a log or a snapshot, to a group of agents. That means that every agent that loads with a given tag will implicitly get the actions of that tag. By the way, notice that in VS Code, we need to add actions from the left pane. The UI is a bit different here due to the constraints of the actual IDE, so right-clicking isn't available within the UI itself. It's, most of the concepts are still very similar. Adding an action to a tag is pretty similar to adding it to an agent. We just add it and it looks the same so far. Now that it's added, let's move to the agents view and wait for an agent to come online and trigger the snapshot. By the way, notice that the UI for all of this, again, is very similar in spirit to the one in PyCharm. We now have an agent that's running and we got notification that the snapshot was hit. Let's go into the snapshot tab and click the snapshot. Unlike PyCharm, we need to open the snapshot manually and it looks more like a VS Code breakpoint, which is good as it's native to the IDE. But the core idea, the UI, is of the snapshot with the stack variables, etc. That's the same as it was with PyCharm. In closing, I'd like to go over what we discussed here and a few things we didn't have time for. Lightrun supports JVM languages like Java, Kotlin, Scala, etc. It supports Node both for JavaScript and TypeScript code. It supports Python, as we discussed today, even the complex stuff like Airflow. When we add actions, conditions run within a sandbox so they don't take up CPU or crash the system. This all happens with it without networking, so something like a networking hiccup won't crash the server. Security is especially crucial with solutions like this. 
One of the core concepts is that the server queries information, not the other way around as you would see with solutions such as JDWP, etc. That means operations are atomic and the server can be hidden behind firewalls even from the rest of the organization. PII reduction lets us define conditions that would obscure patterns in the logs. So if a user could print out a credit card number by mistake, you can define a rule that would block that. This way, the bad data won't make it into your logs and won't expose you to liability. Blacklisting lets us block specific classes, methods, or files. This means you can block developers in your organization from debugging specific files. This means a developer won't be able to put a snapshot or log in a place where a password might be available to steal user credentials or stuff like that. This is huge, hugely important in large organizations. Besides the sandbox, I'd also like to mention that Lightrun is very efficient and in our benchmarks has almost no runtime impact when it isn't used. It has very small impact even with multiple actions in place. Finally, Lightrun can be used from the cloud or using an on-premise install. It works with any deployment you might have, whether cloud-based, container-based, on-premise, microservice, serverless, etc. Thanks for bearing with me. I hope you I hope you enjoyed this enjoyed this presentation and uh, enjoyed your tea. Please feel free to ask me any questions uh, and write to me. Uh, my email and social networks uh, are listed right here. Also, please check out talktotheduck.dev where I talk about debugging in depth and check out lightrun.com, which I think you guys will like a lot. If you have any questions, again, my email is listed here and I'll be happy to help. Thank you and good night and good luck. All right, thank you. <clears throat> Sorry. <laughs> I apologize for the technical issue we had earlier. Thank you. That was a beautiful talk on debugging Python applications with Lightrun. This will definitely come in handy when we're trying to squash those pesky bugs. We're going to be back in about 20 to 25 minutes. Feel free to grab a coffee, a tea, or a beer if that's your thing. Thank you, and we'll be right back. Thank you.